يا أهل الجنة إن ربكم تبارك وتعالى يستزيركم فحي على زيارته الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا Dear respected brothers and sisters and those who are going to be listening online we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has facilitated this visit here to Newbury Masjid to conduct the seminar on everything you need to know about the topic of menses. Of course, we're not going to be covering every single aspect that relates to menses, but inshallah ta'ala, the marju, that which we hope, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, is that everyone here today and those who are listening online are going to walk away with that which they are in need of in order to carry out the acts of worship in a manner that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, Bin the ta'ala today, we're going to be covering a range of points that come under this topic of menses. There will be five minute breaks for every 50 minutes because I know the attention span is really, really low. So for every 50 minutes bi ta'ala, we'll have maybe five to seven minute break and then we will commence bi ta'ala. We hope to finish it bi al-bari in the space of two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. So some of the points that I hope to cover today under the fiqh of menstruation and everything that you need to know as someone who is religiously obliged are the following points. Number one, shyness when it comes to knowledge. Shyness when it comes to knowledge. Is this something that one should be shy of? Especially when it comes to asking sensitive questions. Number two, the danger of praying without wudu. Number three, why this topic is also for men. Right? We had some mixed comments and messages online, which I will inshallah ta'ala touch on. Number four, why men speak about these topics? Some of our sisters who have been brainwashed by feminists, they became extremely, extremely erratic online as they usually do. When they see the announcement of Abu Taymiya teaching this topic on uh, women related issues. Number one, two, three, four, five. Number five, one, two, three, four, five. No. The different discharges that a woman releases. Number six, the duration of the minimal and maximal duration of menses. The norm of how long it lasts. The least interval between two cycles. The next point after that is the difference between menses and also istihada. Most of the questions that we receive, most of the questions that we receive are related to, right, a woman not being able to distinguish between that which is natural like al-hayd, hayd, which is menses, her monthly cycle, and also istihada, which is an irregular, abnormal discharge that a woman has to deal with, a type of vaginal bleeding. Then also, ta'ala, we are going to discuss if a woman gets her menses on one day and doesn't get it the next day on her normal days. What does she do? Also, ta'ala, after that, what a woman on her menses cannot do and what her husband can and can't do with his wife when she is on her menses. Also, after that, what a woman with istihada must do, yani this irregular, abnormal, continuous vaginal bleeding, right? The do's and the don'ts for her. Then also, bi ta'ala, the yellowness and the murky, brownish discharge. The next point after that, delaying the prayer. And then your menses starting. Again, it's a very, very common question. Asr Salah has kicked in and then she delays her prayer. Right? We're still within that Asr period. Right? We're still in the Asr period. But her menses starts. What does she do? Does she have to make it up eight days later when her menses comes to an end? It's a common question that sister tends to ask. Menses and fasting also, we want to cover that. Taib. When a woman now comes off her menses at either 
Asr period, which is before Maghrib, or she comes off her menses at Isha time. What prayers does she now have to pray? Does she only pray, for example, now Asr? Or does she have to pray Dhuhr with it? Or if she now comes off her menses before Fajr, does she only have to pray Aisha or does she have to pray Maghrib with it as well? Don't worry, we're going to go into all of that inshallah ta'ala. Then the next point, signs of when the monthly cycle has come to an end. Right? And also, bi ta'ala, the end, we will cover the rutuba, the natural discharge that a woman releases from her front private part. Right? Again, it's a very, very common question that sisters tend to send in all the time. Right? And at the end, uh, after that, we will go through some questions that are very, very common. And perhaps we'll open the floor for our sisters to maybe ask questions, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyib. So the first point I want to cover, bi ta'ala, al-haya'u fil ilm. Shyness when it comes to knowledge. Should one be shy? Generally speaking, my sisters, one of the characteristics and traits that beautifies and adorns a woman, and not just women, I shouldn't just say women, but also men, is the trait of shyness. Right? And this is a trait, a quality that protects one from a lot of haram, both for male and female. When that shyness diminishes, one will begin to really lose control over themselves. Their life will spiral out of control, sins after sins, and that is after shyness has been stripped away. This is after one has lost their shyness. Right? Where did I take this from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my sisters, He speaks about two types of clothing in the Quran. Right? Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks about two types of clothing in the Quran. Ya bani Adam la yaftinannakum ash-shaytanu kama akhraja abawaykum min al-jannah yanzi'u anhuma libasahuma liyuriyahuma sawatihima innahu yarakum huwa wa qabiluhu min haythu la tarawnahum. Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us, don't let the shaytan tempt you into doing haram. The same way he kicked your parents out of al-jannah. What did he do? He managed to strip them of their clothing. Right? Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. Right? We are also told, وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خير. Right? Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-A'raf speaks about the clothing that one wears and also another type of clothing called لِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى The clothing of taqwa. طيب. Can someone now wear taqwa on his sleeve? Is that something that one can wear? Of course not. It is a spiritual matter. It is an action of the heart. Taqwa. What do the scholars mention, my sisters? Right? What do the scholars mention? When you now begin to lose that clothing of taqwa, which you need to adorn your heart with, you need to clothe your heart with what? A taqwa. Metaphorically speaking. By doing that which is right and staying away from that which is wrong. Right? If you don't do that, if you continue doing that which displeases Allah, especially when around the opposite gender, that will diminish and diminish and diminish up until the shyness is completely gone. And once that is gone, your clothes will start coming off one by one. And tell me if I'm wrong, my sisters. This is for both men and women. You're around the opposite gender, freely mixing, right? Or doing that which is inappropriate or that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having these, I'll call it innocent chit chats, right? Which then turns into that which is a lot more serious. You will see the clothing eventually coming off, one after the other, right? And once the shyness is gone, as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِتْ If you don't have shyness, then go and do as you wish. The scholars, they mention two meanings, or maybe even more, but we'll stick to two meanings. The first one is, right? If you don't have shyness, go do as you wish, because you will be punished. It's a threat, a tahdeed. You know how sometimes you say to someone, right? Yeah, go do it, go do it, and then see what happens. Hmm? The second type is a little bit like the salah. We know that as long as you're praying, 
as long as you're praying, it is protecting you from a lot of filth. I asked my little sister the other day, right? What happens, Fatima? Right? If you stop praying. I was very, very happy to hear this from her. She goes, your whole life will come crashing down. That salah is protecting you from a lot of filth. This is why we tell the sinner, and even the girl who goes clubbing or the drug dealer, I don't care what's happening in your life, don't leave up the salah. No matter what's happening in your life, do not leave off the salah. Because as long as you're praying, there's still hope. Even if you're not wearing hijab, go pray. Right? You shouldn't be made to feel, I'm not wearing hijab, or I'm dressing a certain way. It's a challenge that I'm currently going through. I should what? Stop praying as well, or I'm hypocritical. La. That shyness, right, that we've just been speaking about, works the same way as the salah. As long as you've got that shyness. It protects you from doing haram with the opposite agenda. I'm sure my sisters, we've all been at a stage and we might still be there. And likewise with brothers. Once upon a time, if we wanted to speak to the opposite agenda, we'd be very hesitant. We'd be very, very hesitant. We'd be thinking about how do I speak to them? How can I get my message across? How do I engage? But then it just kind of like reached the point where, you know what? Adi, mafi mushkila, no problem with it. So this is a trait, my sisters, that, and brothers, that is very, very, right, praiseworthy, right, to have that trait of shyness. Even we look at Surat Al-Qasas, the story of Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam, when he migrated to Midian, right, when he migrated to Midian. And then there was these two girls who were sitting away from the rest of the crowd, right? They wanted to quench the thirst of their riding beast or their sheep that they were herding, right? They were sitting apart from everyone, waiting for them to finish. So Musa والسلام, he approached them to help them out. Later on, to cut a very long story short, right? One of them said to the father, why don't you employ him? She was indirecting to her father. He's a good man. You know, make it happen. Right? Make it happen. Then subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us, she approached Musa alayhi salatu was salam. And of all the things that could have been mentioned about this lady, the only thing that was mentioned to us was, فَجَاءَتُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِي عَلَى اسْتِحْيَاءَ she came walking towards him in a manner that was shy, bashful, modest, shyness was mentioned. Out of all the things that could have been mentioned, the only trait that was mentioned was what? Shyness. He worked 10 years, brothers, to pay off the mahar, the dowry. 10 years, 10 years. Right? What is it that he saw in her? The only thing that was mentioned to her was the issue of shyness. The only thing that was mentioned to us was the matter of shyness. 10 years that he worked for. Wallahi, my sisters, even when I speak to a drug dealer, yes, I speak to drug dealers, right? Even when I speak to drug dealers who has girls that he does haram with, he'll say clearly and explicitly, well, I'm going to be honest with you, these girls are not wife material. I want a sister that is shy. This is what he's going to say. I don't want a sister that engages with other men. Even a drug dealer who plays around with women, He's going to say, I want a sister that dresses modestly, that's bashful, that is shy, and so on and so forth. This is one of the characteristics that men really go after. Right? So anyways, this is not a muhadra lesson on shyness. But the point that we're trying to mention here, the asal is that a woman is shy, however, when it comes to knowledge. When it comes to knowledge, al hayau fil ilm, this is not something that should be existent. Mujahid rahimahullah ta'ala, the student Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, لا يتعلم العلم مستحين ولا مستكبر. Two people, they won't learn. The shy one and the one who's arrogant. The shy and the arrogant, these are two people, they won't learn. Because he's shy of asking. The other one is too arrogant to ask. He thinks he knows it all. Right? And we know the hadith of Asma bint Yazid. She came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asking him questions about Ghusl al mahir A woman is on her menses and now she's coming off her menses, taking that purificatory bath. She came to him. 
So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained to her, تَأْخُذُ إِحْدَى كُنَّ مَأَهَا وَسِدْرَتَهَا فَتَطَحَّرْ She needs to take this and she needs to take that and then she cleans herself and she does it properly and then she does this with her hair and she does this with her body and so on and so forth. And then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told her to take فِرْصَةً مُمَسَّكَ To take a cotton, right, that has musk on it. Right? A cotton that has musk on it. And then she's asking, right? How do I clean myself with that? So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told her, right? Tatahirina biha. And she asked, what do you mean, O Messenger? And he told her, clean yourself with it. Right? And then he said one time when he got irritated, Subhanallah, clean yourself with it. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was standing there. And then she explained to exactly how she does it. And then she asked about ghusl al janaba how one takes a purificatory bath after being in the state of janaba at the end aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha she said ni'man nisa'u nisa'u al ansar the best of the women are the women of the ansar lam yakun yamna'uhunna al haya'u an yatafaqahna fi al din shyness did not prevent them from gaining an understanding in the religion so it's important, my sisters, that one asks, that one tries to learn, right? Especially when it comes to these very sensitive matters. So that was the first point that we are covered. The second point, my sisters, is a salatu bi ghayri tahara. Praying without the correct purification, right? Praying without the correct purification. Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi says, فَالْمُسْلِمُ لَا يُصَلِّي إِلَى غَيْرِ قِبْلَةٍ وَبِغَيْرِ وُضُوءٍ One, يعني a Muslim, should not pray, should not pray towards other than the correct qibla. And likewise, he shouldn't pray without wudu. Right? Or he shouldn't pray without ruku' or sujood. And then he says, وَمَنْ فَعَلَ ذَلِكَ كَانَ مُسْتِحِقًّا لِلذَّمِّ وَالْعِقَابِ And anyone who does that, then he's deserving of being punished. Right? This hadith, my brothers and my sisters, Subhanallah, is a very, very heart-pelting or shaking hadith. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, أُمِرَ بِعَبْدٍ مِنْ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُضْرَبَ فِي قَبْرِهِ مِئَةُ جَلْدَةِ There was an instruction for a man to be lashed inside of his grave. For him to be lashed a hundred lashes. And he kept on being lashed. وَيَدْعُوا And he kept on calling out. Right? Why are you guys doing this to me? Up until 100 lashes became one lash. فَجُلِدَ جَلْدَةً وَاحِدَةً فَامْتَلَأَ قَبْرُهُ عَلَيْهِ نَارًا And his grave became filled with fire. فَلَمَّا ارْتَفَ عَنْهُ أَفَاقَ And then when he gained consciousness again, قَالَ عَلَى مَا جَلَدْتُمُونِ Why was I lashed? قَالُوا إِنَّكَ صَلَّيْتَ وَاحِدَةً بِغَيْرِ طَهُورٍ Indeed, you prayed a prayer without purification. And likewise, you walked past a person who was being oppressed and you did not help him. You did not aid him. So this term here, this is what we want to talk about or stand over. You prayed a prayer without tahara, right? It could mean that you didn't do it properly knowingly and you still continue praying. Also, what could be understood from this is, right? This person intentionally did not make wudu and he started praying. Or, this individual, my sisters, he didn't go out his way to learn about that which is wajib upon him. That which is mandatory upon him. There are certain acts of knowledge, my sisters, that is mandatory for one to learn. We don't say to everyone, go and learn about hajj. Did anyone ever turn around to you guys and say, you must go and learn about hajj? No. Unless you have the means for it, only then we say it is mandatory upon you. Right? Or when that time comes for you now to go and carry out that act of worship. As for us saying to everyone, go and do hajj. Oh, sorry, you have to go and learn about hajj. This is not something that we can impose. Then you also have certain acts of worship such as tahara. For women, menses. Right? And everyone else, fasting. Because we fast every year. These are the type of things that we're involved in regularly that we have to learn about. So as you guys can see, my sisters, it is extremely, extremely important the next hadith that I want to mention under this point is Hadith Abi Hurairah. 
النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن الرجل لا يصلي ستين سنة right أو إن الرجل لا يصلي ستين سنة وما تقبل له صلاة لعله يتم الركوع ولا يتم السجود one may pray right for sixty years and when praying for sixty years right when praying for sixty years he doesn't do his ruku' properly and he doesn't do his sujood properly and he might well be right sorry let me rephrase that la yutimmu sujood right wa yutimmu ruku' he does the sujood properly but he doesn't do the ruku' properly or he might do the ruku' properly but he doesn't do the sujood properly and none of his salawat are going to be accepted my sisters and brothers and that is because he's not doing it properly right and the reason I mention this hadith, even though it's speaking about the salah, it might well be that we're praying for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I remember I launched this course in the COVID period, 500 people signed up to it, 500. 400 of them were sisters, both old and young. And there was 100 brothers, right? There was 100 brothers. Sisters said at the end, Wallahi al-Azim, mums, some of them might even be old enough to be my grandmother. Allahu alam. They will say things such as 30 years, 40 years we were doing, right, our prayers incorrectly. We thought that it was okay for us to pray, but in reality we didn't need to pray. Or maybe we were praying, but we weren't in the state of prayer. Or we thought that we were in the state of prayer, but in reality we weren't. Right, and because of that our salat perhaps maybe hasn't been accepted. Here the Messenger of Allah is talking about 60 years he's been praying, but he wasn't doing it properly and he wasn't accepted from him. Right? So this is very, very important, my sisters. Another point that I want to mention under this one here, right? The scholars of our deen, they have unanimously agreed. Someone now who intentionally prays without tahara. Right? It is haram for him to pray without tahara, right? But he what? Does it making it halal for himself. This is istihlal or out of mockery. Some people they start praying. Making a joke out of it. This person has become a kafir. This person has disbelieved. That's the first scenario. The second scenario is someone who just like out of laziness prays without tahara. Not making it halal or not doing it out of mockery. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa was one of the four great Imams of Fiqh. He took the view that he becomes a kafir as well. It's not unlike matter. You know, someone, I remember when he was growing up, people say, you know what? Making wudu is a bit long. Let me just pray anyway. Allah is ghafoor rahim. Allah is going to be forgiving. Right? However, the majority of the scholars, they see this to be from the most major of sins. Right? Imam al rahmatullahi alayhi, he's got some kalam on this as well. But ala kulli hal, as you guys can see, it's a very, very important topic, right? Uh, that we need to be very, very careful with. Also, my sisters, just to make it very, very clear, right? I think it was very, very clear on the poster as well that this is actually a seminar. This is more knowledge based, it's not a lecture. So it would be a very good idea for you to have your pens and your papers. Even my little sister, when I was driving her down, I told her that she has to write everything down, right? And she has to show me her notes after. Inshallah ta'ala. Fatima, I'm waiting for it. Okay? I need to see your notes after. Because there's a lot that we're going to take. A lot that we're going to take. It's not a heart softener. I don't expect you guys to walk away from the lecture. Ah, oh, that was so good for my heart. Right? Maybe the event that we're doing later which is called Unbroken in Whitechapel, that's maybe more of a heart softener, right? And some of the other heart softening reminders that we have online. We have to do a balance. It's not always just about heart softening lectures. Your iman might go up when you listen to these lectures, but it's only going to come crashing down if you don't maintain it. How do you maintain your iman being high? It's by learning about your deen and how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyip. Why this topic, my sisters, is also for men and why they tend to speak about these topics. 
right? Why they tend to speak about these topics. Al-Barqawi, rahmatullahi alayhi, was from the major Hanafi scholars. He was very, very good at fiqh and likewise hadith. He says, يجب على الرجل أن يتعلم الحيضة ليعلم أهل بيته. He said, it is a must, it is a must upon men, right, to learn about matters pertaining to menses. Why? لِيُعَلِّمَ أَهْلَ بَيْتِهِ In order to teach his family. In order to teach his family. A lot of feminists became extremely upset, as they usually do. How is this guy speaking about women-related issues? What I say to the feminists all the time, تفضلي, right, come to the class, learn and then maybe Abu Taymiyyah doesn't have to deliver this class the reason why I'm delivering this class is because I have right a huge number of messages that I receive on a regular basis of sisters confused I think it to myself like do you guys not have women in your community that you could go back to but unfortunately that is not the case right that isn't actually the case also, when you think about it now, right? You as a husband, if you don't know these matters, your wife's gonna have to go and approach a sheikh, right? And experience a very, very, mm, you know, might not necessarily be a positive experience of her having to give out certain descriptions of her private part. Yes, we mentioned at the beginning, right? That's important for a woman to ask these questions. But I think you would probably want to avoid that kind of scenario by just having that knowledge and to answer the questions of your wives or your mother or your daughters. Right? I'm sure they will feel more comfortable asking their husbands than what? Asking an individual that they have absolutely no relationship with. Right? Also, there's, main, there's two main reasons as to why you could maybe say that men speak about this matter. Hmm? No, sorry, we've already mentioned that. Um, the next point I wanted to mention was um, Babul Hayyat is actually extremely, extremely difficult to understand. Right? It can be very difficult at times to understand. Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi would say, Kuntu fi kitab al hayzi tis'a sinin hatta fahimtu. Nine years I was studying the chapter of menses. Nine years. Only then I understood it. Only then I managed to understand it. Even Al Allama Hamad ibn Muhammad al Ansari, he would say, Inna kitab al hayzi darastu ala al madahi al arba'a. The chapter of hayyid, I studied it, I studied it. With all of the four madahib, all of the four madahib, with different mashayikh, and even after all of that, I still found it difficult. Right? And whenever I'm asked a question about this, is a big sheikh, by the way, he's teaching the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's masjid. Whenever I'm asked a question about this matter, I become more confused than a lizard. Mm. So, why is it actually so hard? There's two reasons as to why it's so hard to understand. Even for men, scholars, they might get a little bit confused about it. Number one, simply because it's a woman-related matter. And normally those who research it and write about it are men. Right? I'll tell you guys a funny incident that took place between a Shafi'i scholar called Tajuddin Subki and also a female scholar. A female scholar called Fatima to Bintu Ayash Al Hambaliya. She was what? A female scholar that used to teach the Hambali Madhab. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah used to praise her so much, subhanAllah. Have you guys heard of that book called Al Mughni? It's approximately maybe what? 15 volumes depending on the Tab'a. Right? Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhi says about her, the, the, the famous Mufassir of the Quran, he says about her that she, right? knew the, mo the, 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 the majority of that from the top of her head. Subhanallah. Mughni, not Mughni, right? 15 <laughs> volumes. She knew the majority of that from the top of her head. Subhanallah. 
Shaykh al Islam Taymiyyah used to praise her a lot. She used to ask him questions. And likewise, she was known to refute falsehood as well. Allahu Akbar. And she was the reason, subhanAllah, why so many women, so many women memorized the Quran, my sisters and my brothers. From amongst those who memorized the Quran with Fatima al Hanbaliyah was the mother in law of. Sorry. Minhunna umm zawjati Aisha, zawjati Sheikh Jamaluddin al Mizzi. Naam. The mother in law of Ibn Kathir, rahmatullahi alayhi. She also memorized the Quran, right? At the hands of Fatima al Hanbaliyah. Who said a woman cannot become a scholar? Allahu Akbar. Which we hope, inshallah ta'ala, for all of our sisters today who have attended now to become very learned and then to go and enlighten the Muslims. To go and enlighten sisters especially. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them acquiring an education and then teaching the other sisters. I'd personally rather have sisters teaching these issues than me having to conduct lessons on it. The reason why I am actually now conducting this lesson because I became... I was going to say sick and tired, but no, I haven't become sick of it. Because the end day is deen. But I became so tired every single time. These questions keep reoccurring. Right? Of our sisters. And the scary idea of them now maybe going years, praying incorrectly. Right? Allahu Akbar. Many of the women in Damascus, right, they learned Quran from this lady. So that's why it's very hard. So anyways, the reason why uh, I was mentioning uh, this first point, it's a woman-related issue, right? The incident that happened between Taj al and Subki and also Fatima to al Fatima to bint Ayyash. One time he went to ask her a couple of questions, right? And he got a little bit ahead of himself. He started going back and forth with her and she got very irritated and then she said to him, listen, نَحْنُ أَعْلَمُ بِأَنفُسِنَا We know about ourselves more than you. Right? Stop going back and forth with me. Take what I'm saying to you. And he's a great scholar from the Shafi'is. And then the argument or the debate or the discussion came to an end. Take what I'm telling you. And hit the road. Number two. Al-Amru Thani. Anna hadha al-baba mukhtalifun bayna nisa ikhtilafun kathiran jiddan. Right? Even amongst women, it is not something that is what? Consistent amongst them. Which I'm sure all of you guys will agree. Right? It is inconsistent. It is inconsistent amongst them. Right? As for men, that which they experience or the discharges that they have to deal with, there are a set number of issues and it's pretty clear in dealing with it. How with women there is inconsistencies amongst them. They have different situations, especially in today's day and age, when there is a, a, uh, يعني, uh, a pandemic of women having these tablets which delays their menses, right? I, I, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about, right? These tablets are sometimes consumed in order to delay it because maybe she's going Umrah or maybe because of Hajj or maybe because of Ramadan or maybe there's certain things that she wants to do, right? In order to delay it, she'll have these tablets and that just messes up your cycle. That messes up your cycle. So this is why it's an issue that is pretty hard which requires a lot of attention and focus. Fatim, you're writing down, right? Like. So now, next point. The different discharges that a woman has to deal with. Right? We're going to take a principle, my sisters. The principle is every discharge that comes out of a woman's front private part, it breaks your wudu. Breaks your wudu. So some of those discharges are, for example now, al-mani, which I think everyone is well aware of. Many means sperm. Right? Both men and women, right, ejaculate that. Many. It is called many with an N. Then you also have medhi. Medhi is that which comes out at the time of being aroused. So at the beginning of sexual intercourse, the way to distinguish between the two is that many comes out at the beginning and then many comes out at the end. 
Then you have also al wadi. You also have what al wadi, right? Which is impure, and normally comes out at a time of carrying some very heavy things. Or when he's been walking for a very long time, he might discharge this kind of. No. Then you also have what al hayyud, which is menses. Hayyud is menses, and this is a natural type of discharge. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Inna hada shayun katab Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala ala banati Adam." This is indeed something that Allah Azza Wa Jal has prescribed upon the women, right, or upon the children, the daughters of Adam. Right? It's a natural, tabi'i type discharge. However, you have then something else called istihada which is an irregular, abnormal, continuous, right, vaginal bleeding. It's an irregular, continuous, abnormal, vaginal bleeding, right? And this is where majority of questions and ishkaliyat issues stem off from or originate from. Finding yourself in a situation where you can't distinguish between the two. You have this continuous blood that just keeps going on. It goes on for maybe like 30 days. Or normally you have your menses that only goes on for 7-8 days. But then this month is going on for 16 days, 17 days, 18 days. Right? And how to distinguish between the two. And then of course, last but not least, and nifas post-natal bleeding. Post-natal bleeding. Sisters, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to give you guys a five minute break because what I'm about to mention now requires a lot of your focus. Requires a lot of your focus. We're going to be taking quite a few figures pertaining to the minimal and maximal duration, the norm of how long it lasts for, the least interval between the two after my menses has come to an end, how long do I have to wait in order for it now to be considered, right, menstruation after coming off my menses can I start my menses again after two days or after three days this is what we're going to be taking inshallah ta'ala right after our five minute break so now inshallah ta'ala as mentioned we will go through some of the figures that is very very important that a woman is accustomed with right so you're going to need your pen and your paper right the duration of the minimal and maximum time that your menses can go on for. The norm of how long that it lasts for. The least interval between two monthly cycles. So let's write this down inshallah ta'ala. The least, the least that your menses has to go on for in order for it to be considered menses is a day and a night. Anything less than 24 hours is not considered menses. Right? Is not considered menses. And I'll give you guys, inshallah ta'ala, the evidence as to how we came about with all of these figures. Right? So a day and a night. This is very, very important. Why is it important? The reason why it's important, my sisters and my brothers, is... This will determine now as to whether I have to make up prayers or not. Someone may think, okay, now I've started my menses. But then, it stopped after like six, seven hours. Right? Thinking that one is on her menses, she didn't pray the whole. You would say, okay, now you need to what? Pray the Dhuhr prayer. You thought that it was menses, but in reality it wasn't. So it would have to last for 24 hours in order for it to be considered menses. What is the norm of how long the menses goes on for? The norm is to have it for six or seven days. The norm is for it to go on for six or seven days. We said norm. We didn't say that this is consistent with every single female human being. Right? Some may have it for eight days. But we said the norm is six or seven days. And there's a reason why we said specifically six or seven. But like I said, it differs and it varies. Right? From 
woman to woman. The longest that your menses can last for is what? 15 days. The longest that a woman's menses can last for is 15 days. So anything after that, anything after that is not considered menses. It would be considered what? Istihada. This irregular, abnormal, continuous vaginal bleeding. طيب. So now the figures that we have is number one. And then we have six or seven. And then we also have what? Fifteen. And then the next one, my sisters, is the minimal duration between two cycles. Let's just say, for example, a woman came off her menses on the 15th right, of this month. Is it possible now for her to restart her monthly cycle on the 17th? No. There has to be a 13-day period between two cycles. Is there a limit to the maximum duration between two cycles? The answer is no. So a woman came off her menses on the 15th of this month, my sisters and my brothers. Right? Is it possible now for her not to have her menses for the next six months without a shadow of a doubt? Yes. There are cases where a woman only has her menses once a year. Right? So she had her menses. Does she have to now have her cycle 13 days later? No, it's not a must. So there isn't a maximum duration between two monthly cycles. And by the way, my brothers and my sisters, what I mention here is mainly based on the Hanbali and also the Shafi'i Madhab. Right? I hope that makes sense, inshallah ta'ala. So if you hear maybe something that is a little bit out of touch with what you have previously been taught, right? It's maybe because of the different views amongst the Madhab. However, we're going off with these figures because we want to build a base. We want to become accustomed with something that we become familiar with and then maybe later on, right? When you become like this great scholar Fatima al Hanbaliya, Fatima bint Ayash, you can go into debates and maybe extrapolate that which you think is the most strongest when you reach that level of ishtihad. Inshallah ta'ala. So where did we get these figures from? Where did we get these figures from? Figure from. Figures from, right? We have... An Athar of Ali ibn Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This lady came to Ali ibn Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu and she made a claim. The claim that she made was that her husband divorced her. Right? After a woman is divorced by her husband, how many days does she have to wait? What's the period that she was her waiting period before she can get remarried? I can hear sisters saying three months. Is that accurate though? It is more accurate to say, my sisters, three menstrual cycles. Three menstrual cycles, because as we mentioned before, it differs and it varies, right? It, dif it differs and it varies uh, from woman to woman. Hmm? So it might not necessarily always last for three months. However, a woman doesn't have menses for whatever reason it might be. It could be due to menopause now. Khalas, she's reached that stage where she no longer has uh, uh, menses anymore. We say to her three months. Only then we say to her three months. But the asal is, the default position, three cycles that she has to wait before she can get remarried. However, this lady that came to Ali ibn Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, she's claiming that, right? فَزَعَمَتْ أَنَّا حَاضَتْ فِي شَهْرٍ ثَلَاثَ حِيَضٍ طَهُرَتْ عِنْدَ كُلِّ قُرْءٍ وَصَلَّتْ She made a claim that, right? She had her menses in one month three times. She made a claim that she had her menses three times in that month. And each time, she came off, she had her purificatory bath, she had she done her ghusl, she prayed, and then her monthly 
period started off again. So let's now try to calculate this to see whether this is possible or not. Huh? So Ali ibn Talib, he was sitting with Shurayh at the time. He said to Shurayh, what do you think? Right? Even Ali was like, is this possible? إِنْ جَاءَتْ بِبَيِّنَةٍ مِنْ بِطَانَةِ أَهْلِهَا مِمَّنْ يُرْضَى دِينُهُ وَأَمَانَتُهُ Right? فَشَهِدَتْ بِذَلِكْ وَإِلَّا فَهِيَ كَاذِبَةٌ فَقَالَ عَلِيٌّ قَالُونَ If she can bring forth a witness from her family that can maybe bear witness that this actually did happen, then maybe we'll take a testimony for it. Ali then said, great. قَالُونَ means جيد. طيب. So let's try to calculate to see whether this is actually possible. How many days in a month? 30 days. I need your attention, sisters. Please focus. Right? 30 days in a month, right? Let's see whether it's possible. How long did we say the least that your menses needs to go on for? How long did we say that the least was? One day, 24 hours. So now we are on day number one. Sahih? We are on day number one. She had her menses for 24 hours. We said in order... For her to have another monthly cycle, how many days does she need to wait for? 13 days. So 13 plus 1 is how much? 14. So 13 days have come to an end. And then we mentioned that the least that the menses needs to go on for is for how long? Huh? One day, good, 24 hours. So 14 plus 1 is how much you know? 15. And then we mention how long does she have to wait before her next menses? 13 days. Good. 15 plus 13 is how much? 28. Good. How many times has she already had a menses? Twice. Good. 128, right? How many days left to the end of the month? Two days. She then has her menses on the 29th day. Is it possible for a woman to have three menses in the same month? According to what we just mentioned? So was this lady lying? No, she wasn't lying. Because this actually happened with a woman, and this was historically documented, they said we can actually what? Base rulings on it. Due to it being possible. Right? Due to it being possible. Did everyone get that? Huh? So the figures that we had was, one... Which was the day on a menses when it lasted for 24 hours and then 13 days. 1 plus 13 is what? 24. And then she had a menses for 24 hours. That's what? Huh? 15. 15 plus 13 makes it 28. And then she had her menses for one day. 29. And then she has still one day left. So it's something that has been historically documented that actually took place. So this is where all of these figures came from. So we know that it's actually substantiated with an evidence. Taib, where did we get the six or seven figure from? Where did we get it from? Right? My sisters, it's important that we know, and this is if you want to, inshallah ta'ala, do research in the future. Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned, the issues pertaining to menses, it revolves around three hadiths. It revolves around three ahadith. I want you guys to write this down. The first hadith is the hadith of Fatima to bin to Abi Hubesh. The hadith of Fatima to bin to Abi Hubesh. Number two, the hadith of Hamna. It's a long hadith. She was suffering from this continuous, irregular, abnormal vaginal bleeding, and then she came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To seek clarification. It's a long hadith. Number three, Ummu Habiba. The hadith of Ummu Habiba. Right? And there was another statement of Imam Ahmed. Instead of saying the hadith of Ummu Habiba, he said the hadith of Ummu Salama. We'll take all of these four hadith. It mainly revolves around these three hadith, but you can add the fourth one to it as well, the hadith of Ummu Salama. These are very well known hadith. So anyways, in this hadith of Hamna, my brothers and sisters, right? She came up to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
to seek a fatwa. She said, Ya Rasulullah, kuntu ustahadu haydatan kabiratan shadeedah. My vaginal bleeding, it goes on and on and on. Right? When do I pray? What is this? The Messenger Sallallahu Wasallam told her, إِنَّمَا هِيَ رَكْضَةٌ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ This is a kick from the shaytan. The shaytan kicks you. You know, the scholars, they discuss what does it actually mean, right? Uh, of the shaytan actually kicking you. It means that he harmed her. وَهُوَ سَبَمُ الْإِضْرَارِ وَالْإِفْسَادِ وَالْمُرَادُ أَنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ ضَرَبَ هَذَا الْعِرْقَ مِنَ الْمَرْأَةِ ضَرْبًا حَقِيقِينَ He actually physically abused her. Up until this vein inside of her body exposed, uh, exploded, sorry. Right? Or the shaytan, all the scholars they mentioned, the shaytan found the way now to confuse her, right? In how to distinguish between that which is natural and that which is not. Right? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he told her, فَتَحَيَّضِي سِتَّةَ أَيَّامٍ أَوْ سَبْعَةَ ثُمَّ اخْتَسِلِي Her vaginal bleeding is going on for days and days and days and days. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to her, you should only consider six or seven days to be menses. Anything other than that is not considered menses. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uttered six or seven days. This is where the scholars extrapolated from that the norm is six or seven days. So this is what? Perfectly normal for one to have her menses for six or seven days. It is not absolute. It is not only six or seven. Some sisters, they have it consistently eight days, nine days. We said, we said that the maximum that your menses can go on for is how many days? Ah, 15, excellent. 15 days. So more can happen. But we said the norm, that which you tend to find quite common is six or seven days. So now that we're done with the figures, right? We want to move on to the next point, which is the differences between menses and istihada from the most common of questions, my sisters and my brothers, is how do I distinguish? How do I know that it's hayd? Is it actually istihada? What is it? I'm confused. We are now going to go through some furuq, some differences. Right? Sisters, by the way, do you, do you, what I'm, are you guys finding it difficult to understand what I'm saying? Right? Alhamdulillah. Hopefully it's not going to take you nine years like Imam Ahmed. Inshallah ta'ala. Of course, the reason why Imam Ahmed rahmatullahi alayhi may actually have found difficult, and of course he is the Imam of the Madhab. Right? He memorized... Only Allah Azza wa knows best how many hadith, right? Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi, even within his madhab at times, he would have more than one view. And the reason why he would have more than one view is because of all of the hadith that he was dealing with, right? He had access to so many hadith, right? So he might take a position because of a hadith that he came across, and then he changes that because of another hadith. So this is why sometimes in one, uh, particular view, uh, one particular mas'ala he has more than one view right and you can imagine how difficult it would be you got all of these hadith and it's a woman related issue and even amongst them when you ask them questions they're giving you conflicting information right which makes you even more confused but then of course as time went on the madahib they were uh, they went through different stages where he was studied and he was built on, right, and formed, and so on and so forth, it started becoming a lot more clear. And the reason, and I'm teaching this, my sisters, after how many years? Like I, Allah, when I first studied it, they always say the beginning of the chapter of Tahara and the end of chapter of Tahara, the hardest. That which relates to water and then that which relates to menses. I was lost. But then it took a lot of time, a lot of time. I taught it a couple of times. I did a lot of research. And then I'm just giving you guys a humble khulasa, a humble uh, summary of what I hope, inshallah ta'ala, you guys will find easy to understand. So what are some of the differences? Number one, my sisters, 
the color. The way to distinguish between what? Menses, which is perfectly natural. In the Shayun Katabullah ala Balati Adam, as the Messiah said, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed upon the daughters of Adam. Perfectly normal. Damul Hayd Aswad. Wal istihawa to Ahmar. Menses has a blackish color to it. Istihawa, it has a reddish color to it. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Inna dam al hayzi damun aswad yu'raf. Menses is a black type of discharge that is very well known. Number two, my sisters, al riqqa. Right? When looking at the thickness of this discharge, damul hayyad, menses, right, is thick. Istihada, in comparison to istihada, it is a lot thinner or a lot lighter. Number three, al-ra'iha, the smell of it. Damul hayd muntinun karihu al-ra'iha. Wal istihada tu ghayru muntin. Menses, it has an unpleasant smell to it. Hey, the best way to put it. Istihada is the opposite of that. Okay? Or maybe the term to use is odorless. Right? So we mentioned three things. Number one, that which relates to the color. Hayd, menses, has a blackish color to it. Istihada has a reddish color to it. Then we also talked about the thickness of it. Hayd tends to be thicker. Istihada is a lot flowy, a lot more flowier, that's even a word, a lot lighter. And then you have what? The smell. Naam. Other scholars, they add to it, right? Kathra. Uh, right? Kathra. Meaning, the amount that comes out. The amount that comes out. Right? There's another way now to distinguish between the two. Right, the poet he says, Right? And then the fifth way is scholars may add on, but I want you guys to really just focus on the three. The pain that one begins to feel, spasms and cramp. That one begins to experience before, right? The menses is about to occur. Now inshallah ta'ala my sisters I want to speak about Is everything okay so far? It's pretty straightforward right? I think that's pretty straightforward The three different cases That a woman May find herself in When experiencing This irregular Abnormal Continuous Vaginal bleeding Thalath halat Alright again Sister messages in She's confused about which of the three actually apply to her? Right? Number one. It is a woman that has an ada. I want you guys to write it down. Right? This Arabic term. Even write it down with English letters. Ada. By the way, you write in Arabic is Ain, Alif, Dal, and then the Ta. Naam. Ada. Which means a typical monthly cycle. That she's acquainted with every month. That which reoccurs. Right? So this woman now, her bleeding all of a sudden now is just continuing, continuing, continuing. This woman is used to her menses going on for seven days every single month. Right? She's used to her monthly cycle going on for seven days every single month. Month one, month two, month three, month four, month five, month six. She always had her menses for seven days. It would normally start around the 15th of every month and it would go on for seven days up till the 22nd. 
that's been happening. And then all of a sudden, this month, it started in the beginning of the month, the first. And I was going on, on and on and on. She comes and asks a question, Sheikh, what do I do? Right? We say to her, do you have an ada? A typical period that you are accustomed to. That normally happens or reoccurs every single month. She will say yes. For the last six months since I started my or started having these monthly cycles, I always had it on the 15th and it would stop on the 22nd. It would go on for seven months. We say to her, this is what you should go off with being your monthly period. And only in that seven day period do you need to stop praying and fasting. The evidence for this, my sisters, is Aisha was narrating it. Fatima bintu Abi Hubaysh. Remember I said the a hadith of Hayd they revolve around? One of them was Fatima bintu Abi Hubaysh. She asked the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَقَالَتْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنِّي إِنِّي امْرَأَتْ إِنِّي امْرَأَتٌ أُسْتَحَاظُ فَلَا أَطْهُرُ أَفَدَعُ الصَّلَاةِ I'm a woman. I'm a woman who suffers from this irregular, abnormal, continuous vaginal bleeding. Right? And it never stops. I never come off it. Shall I stop praying altogether? Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No. إِنَّمَا ذَلِكَ عِرْقٌ This is only what? A split vein. A vein that has split inside of your body. وَلَيْسَ بِحَيْضٍ This is not menses. فَإِذَا أَقْبَلَتْ حَيْضَتُكِ فَدَعِ الصَّلَةِ If your menses starts, meaning on the 15th. We're going to go off with the example that I gave. Once it starts on the 15th, stop praying. وَإِذَا أَدْبَرَتْ And when it now comes to an end, meaning on the 22nd. It's important that we use these examples because with the examples, we can conceptualize it, we can picture it. Right? Even though there's no 15 and 22nd here. huh? It's just me incorporating that into uh, what we are saying so you can, inshallah ta'ala, conceptualize it. 15, it's, that's when you normally have your message, right? Stop praying. Even if blood is coming out, stop praying. Right? وَإِذَا أَدْبَرَتْ فَاغْسِلِ عَنْكِ الدَّمَ ثُمَّ صَلِي And then he stopped. Sorry. On the 22nd. On the 22nd. After that seven day period came to an end. Which you would normally have your menses on every single month. Even if blood is still coming out. Right? You need to clean yourself and then you need to pray. And another riwayah. وَلَكِنْ دَعِ الصَّلَاةَ قَدْرَ الْأَيَّامَ الَّتِي he told her to stop praying only the time when she would normally not be praying in the previous months and then wash yourselves and pray. Even if blood is still coming out? Yes, even if blood is still coming out because that's not considered menses. Did everyone get that first scenario? Or do I need to repeat it? Was that straightforward? Alhamdulillah. So the first lady is the lady, if you guys understand this honestly, you all deserve a blue Peter badge. Right? It's excellent. These three scenarios, I put a lot of thought and time into how I can actually break this down so everyone can understand. This is a woman that has a reoccurring monthly period. However, now all of a sudden, instead of it starting on the 15th, it's starting on the first of the month. And it's just going on and on and on and on. We say to her, look at the adah. That's the first thing that you look at. Al-Hala to Thaniya. The second scenario. Let's just say we had a sister who first started her menses maybe at the age of, we'll say, 14 years of age, right? The first month, her menses starts on the 15th. Right? We'll hold on to the 15th day. It starts on the 15th. It goes on for seven days. The second month, 
it goes on for maybe what? 20 days. Is that possible? Trans is paying attention. Does it go on for 20 days? What's the maximum that it goes on for? Excellent. Good. It went on, so we say, a second month, it went on for 13 days. So from the 15th all the way to the 28th day of that month. That's the second month now. Then the third month, right? So we had seven days that he went on for the first month. And then what? 13. This time round, it goes on for nine days. So we have what? Huh? What was the first one? How many days was the first month? Seven. And then? No, it wasn't 20. That was a trick question. It was 13. And then the third? Huh? Nine. Would you agree that this is now irregular? It is irregular. So this lady, my sister, doesn't have a typical period that she is accustomed to, which reoccurs every single month. It's all over the place. It is irregular. However, however, laha laha, right? Oh, wa kanat mumayza. And la takuna la ada wa kanat mumayza. She doesn't have that which is regular in her monthly cycles. However, she's someone who's mutamayza. What does mutamayza mean? She's able to distinguish between what is hayd and what is not. What is hayd and what is tihad. Do you remember what I went through earlier? The way to distinguish between menses and also istihada. We talked about the color. We talked about the thickness. We talked about the smell. Right? We talked about the spasms. The discomfort that a woman feels just before her menses. She's able now to distinguish. She knows. However, you guys are probably thinking, we just studied it. Everyone should know this now, by now, right? No, even sometimes when you study it, some sisters, they still have an issue of distinguishing between the two. So this woman now, she doesn't have an ada, but she is mutamayiza. This is the term that I want you guys to write down. Mutamayiza. Mutamayiza is a woman that can what? Distinguish between what is hayd and what is what? Istihada. And this lady's scenario, it's pretty straightforward as well. How's distinguish between the two? Right? Distinguish between the two. Number three, and this is the most problematic one. She is considered al mutahayra al mutahayra it is a woman that is confused. She has no ada and she has no tamiz. She has no ada and she has no tamiz. She doesn't have that regular monthly cycle that she's accustomed to. She doesn't have that. No, is she able now to distinguish between the two? And she's coming, she's saying, I'm confused. Right? What does this lady do? What does she do? We say to this lady who is confused that she has to do what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Hamna. What did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say to Hamna who came and complained to him about this excessive, continuous, irregular, abnormal discharge that she began to experience? What did he say to her? For how long should she sit out for for how long what are the two figures that he gave her six or seven days six or seven days sahih which one do you choose we say to you my sister go and check with your family what do you mean right go and ask your mother or maybe your sister a lot of time what happens blood sisters they tend to have the menses around the same time. Am I wrong to say that? Sahih? Zakaria, Sahih? 
I think what they call it is a, I had to write this down one time. You need to check if you are in sync with your sisters. Right? I think that's the word that they use, right? Sync. And sometimes, sisters, they come across friends. They're like their buddies. For when they pray and when they're off. Right? Buddies when they pray and when they're off. So you need to check which one is more closer to the truth. You don't just choose whichever one that you want. Hmm? And that which is most likely. Don't just follow whatever you want. Ah, oh, you know, let me do a seven because I don't want to pray. Like, I want more days of praying. No, my sisters, like, the prayer actually raises your iman. A lot of sisters tend to say when that period comes, the, the iman tends to drop. Don't feel like you're missing out because there's so many different ways that you could actually increase your iman. Right? So it's an opportunity and there are sisters, mashallah, that will say, I can't wait to pray like, I just want to... And when they, when their mens is not coming, they're like, it's like they, it's like they won, you know, you know, alhamdulillah I can pray. So that's the first thing you need to do, my sister. Number two. غسل المحل لإزالة النجاسة You have to make sure that you wash that part of your body, the front private area. And to remove the najasa, to remove the impurities. Okay. Number three. Asbu al-mahalli bi khirqatin wa nahwiha. To apply a tight compress, making sure that nothing leaks out. To apply a tight compress to make sure or to ensure that nothing leaks out. And this is exactly what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Hamna. أَنْعَتُ لَكِي الْكُرْسُفَى فَإِنَّهُ يُذْهِبُ الدَّمَى قَالَتْ هُوَ أَكْثَرُ مِنْ ذَلِكْ قَالَ فَاتَّخِذِي ثَوْبَى Take some clothing and then apply it, right, onto your front private part to prevent a leakage. Right? He first told her to apply a kursuf, a piece of cotton. And then she said, more blood comes out, O Messenger of Allah. It will still leak out. So that's when he told her to take a piece of clothing to apply it onto her front private part to prevent a leakage. I hope that's clear so far, inshallah ta'ala. Number four. يَلْزَمُهَا أَن تَتَوَضَّعَ لِكُلِّ صَلَاةٍ the fourth thing that she needs to do, because this is now continuous, we mentioned that she should only what pick six or seven days, right? Which she doesn't pray for. Then what does she do for the rest of the period? There's still maybe another 23 or 24 days remaining. What does she do? Right? She has to pray. But there's a leakage. The najasa is coming out. It's continuous impurities, right? Continuous discharge. After doing what we just mentioned... The three things. Number four, my sisters is, and brothers, she has to make wudu for every salah. Every time the time of the salah kicks in, she needs to make wudu. And this is what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Fatima to bint Abi Hubaysh. وَتَوَضَّعِ لِكُلِّ صَلَاةٍ حَتَّى يَجِيءَ ذَلِكَ الْوَقْتِ As the time kicked in, even if you had wudu, right? But because, of course, this continuous discharge that you have, even if you made wudu adhur time, you still have to make wudu again. And this is what applies now to anyone who has this continuous discharge. Some people have this uh, medical uh, situation where just urine is coming out all the time. Salis al bowl. Or some may suffer from a continuous, just, you know, passing air all the time. وَنِيَّةٌ ثُمَّ لِدَائِمِ الْحَدَثِ Right? As the poet mentioned, دُخُولُ وَقْتِ فَرْضِهِ شَرْطٌ حَدَثِ Sheikh Amr mentioned in his uh, thousand line poem, or 963 to be more pre- precise. Right? Every time the time of the Salah King makes the intention, okay, and it makes wudu. Every time. Is that clear so far? That's how many things? Four. 
four things that we have taken. Number five, number five, my sisters, I'm really, really hoping that you guys are writing this down. Sisters, you guys are meant to be the ones that now go out and start teaching the communities, right? You need to start conducting courses likewise in universities, just for sisters, right? And in the messages as well. All right, Teskia as well, inshallah. Give you guys a recommendation to go in. Like I was expecting, uh, you know, some of the feminists to turn up. I, I hope they turned up. They've been giving us a hard time on the internet. They have a problem with Abu Taymiya teaching, then come, tfaddali, yani, take the knowledge and then. <laughs> طيب. When it now comes to the salah, this is now point number five with regards to how she carries out the prayer. She has Three options With regards to how She Carries out the prayer In terms of How she makes that wudu Right Number one She makes wudu for every salah that's the first scenario. That's the first option that she has. She makes wudu for every salah. Number two. The second option that she has is to do ghusl for every salah. All right? It's not mandatory, but this is one of the options that she has. And Umm Salim radiallahu ta'ala needs to do that. And of course, that's probably very, very difficult. Number three, the third option that she has is, and pay attention, my sisters, right? And this is what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed Hamna to carry out. In qawiti ala an tu'akhiri al-dhuhra wa tu'ajjili al-asra fataghtasilina wa tajma'ina bayna al-dhuhri wa al-asr wa tu'akhirina al-maghriba wa tu'ajjilina al-ishaa thumma taghtasilin wa tajma'ina bayna al-salatayn fafali Pay attention to this. We have Dhuhr and Asr, right? Where someone is allowed to combine when he goes out for travels. So we'll speak about Dhuhr and Asr together and then Maghrib and Isha together. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Inna salata kanat al mu'minin kitab al mu'khuta. The salah has been prescribed upon everyone to its allocated time. You have to pray each prayer at its time. Agreed? Excellent. Inna salata kanat al mu'minin kitab al mu'khuta. Dhuhr is prayed at Dhuhr time. It has a beginning time, it also has what? An ending time. Likewise, Asr. Asr has a beginning time, it also has what? An ending time. Pay attention to this, right? The third option that you have in terms of how to carry out this prayer is that she does the following. Let's just say Dhuhr starts at let's say 2 o'clock to make it easy. Eh? Dhuhr starts at 2 o'clock. It finishes at 6 o'clock. Right, it finishes at 6 o'clock. That's when Asr starts. And the beginning of Asr time is the end of Dhuhr time. Asr starts at 6. Dhuhr starts when? 1. She can delay Dhuhr all the way till the end of Dhuhr time. Which is, let's just say, 5... 30 p.m. 5 30 p.m. She takes a bath, prays Dhuhr, and then after Asr kicks in, she doesn't need to make wudu again, she doesn't need to take ghusl again, but as soon as Asr kicked in, she can pray Asr. It is as if you combined, but in reality, you didn't. Was that clear in the way I explained it? Did everyone get that? So you delay it all the way till 5.30, which is still Dhuhr time. You do ghusl, you, let's just say you come out of the bathroom, right? 5.45, huh? 15 minutes, took ghusl. It's a woman who's suffering from a continuous, irregular, abnormal, 
vaginal bleeding, right? Istihada. She's going to have an issue with the prayer because she has to make wudu every time. She can delay it all the way to 5.30. She takes a bath, comes out at 5.45, prays duhr. What time does Asr kick in? Six. So I pray maybe took 10 minutes. Let's just say 10 minutes. It's at 5.55. She has to wait five minutes. As soon as six o'clock comes in, she prays the Asr. Does she need to do ghusl twice? No, she doesn't. Does she not need to make wudu again? No, she didn't. Did everyone get that? And she does the same with Maghrib, right? And Isha. Maghrib, she delays it all the way till just before Isha kicks in and she does what I just mentioned. She does Ghusl, prays Maghrib, right? And then she waits till Isha to enter. Once Isha enters, she prays. Everyone get that? And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi said, هو أعجب الأمرين إلي This is the best of the two options to me. Right? So these are three options that a woman has. Number one, that she makes wudu. Every time the time of a prayer kicks in. That means she would have to make wudu how many times in a day? Five. Excellent. The second option, which is of course very, very difficult, that a woman has is to make ghusl every single salah. Number three is what we just mentioned. When she delays one of the prayers up until, it's called what? Al Jam al Suri. Right? When she delays it order to the end, which is still within the Duhr period, she does ghusl, right? And of course, alongside all of the other points that we mentioned, then she waits for Asr to kick in. She prays and then she just can get on with whatever she wanted. When does this come in handy? Comes in handy maybe if a sister wants to wear makeup to a wedding. Right? She doesn't want to take it off. Costs her 300 pounds to put makeup on. No, sometimes they do that, right? To... Number five. You make the intention that you are what? Making the salah halal. It's called nitr istibaha. Because generally speaking, you can't make wudu when you have what? Discharge coming out of you. Generally speaking, you can't. But we mentioned that there is an exemption. If someone suffers from this continuous irregular type of discharge. So your intention needs to be tweaked here a, a little bit and it would be right that you're making this wudu now in order to make the ibadah halal for you even though generally speaking the ibadah is haram because of this continuous discharge that you have inshallah number six yahrumu wat'uha illa ma'a khawf al-anat There's a bit of a difference of opinion on this. Some scholars, they say it is haram to have sexual intercourse with a woman who is suffering from this irregular, abnormal, continuous, right, vaginal discharge. Scholars, they say no. Other scholars, they say yes. And perhaps the stronger view is that one can have sexual intercourse outside of the menses or monthly cycle that a woman has. And that is because of the following reasons. Right? That in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were women who had this issue. Not a single time did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that your husband can't have sexual intercourse with you. Right? There was approximately 17 women in the time of the Prophet Wasallam that had this issue. Not a single time did the Messenger Wasallam ever tell them to stay away from the husbands. Also, if you look at the difference between Haid and, and, and Istihada. Haid only lasts for what? Seven, eight days. Istihada goes on for weeks on end sometimes. So, of course, the woman has sexual desires as well. 
And also Allah Azza wa Jal didn't forget to drop this ruling, right? وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَّا He talked about all the times when you can't have sexual intercourse with a woman. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيطِ Allah told us in a verse, نِسَاءُكُمْ حَرْثٌ لَكُمْ فَأْتُوا حَرْثُكُمْ أَنَّا شِئْتُمْ You are allowed to have sexual intercourse with your wife in every way possible. And then there were exemptions that were made. Allah Azza wa Jal specified it. The Messiah Azam talked about it. The first one was what? حَيْض وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيرِ Having sexual intercourse with a woman when she's what? At that time in a month. And we were also told that one is not allowed to have sexual intercourse with a woman from the back private part. مَلْعُونٌ مَنْ أَتَمْ رَأَةً فِي دُبْرِهَا Curse is the one who does that. So this was all mentioned. However, there was no mention of having sexual intercourse with a woman when she's on a istihada. So perhaps this is the stronger view insha'Allah ta'ala and on that note we actually only have a little bit left of what I wanted to go through right we'll take a five minute break insha'Allah ta'ala we'll take a five minute break and then we'll commence thereafter insha'Allah ta'ala now we are going to go into what a woman on her menses can do and cannot do and likewise that which relates to her husband The first thing that which relates to al-wat, sexual intercourse with a woman on her menses is something that is haram. It's in fact from the major sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيطِ They ask you about menses. قُلْ هُوَ أَذَا سَيْتًا مِجْزْ هَامْفُ فَاعْتَزِلُ النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيطِ Right? Move away from them. يعني do not have sexual intercourse with your women when they are on their menses. Don't come near them, meaning to be intimate with them only after they have had their purificatory bath. And once they come of their menses, then you can go and do with them as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed you why and like we mentioned a man is able to do anything he wishes with his wife unless proven otherwise unless we have an evidence stating otherwise unless we have an evidence stating otherwise Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said man ata haidan aw imra'atan fi duburiha أو كاهنا فصدقه بما يقول فقد كفر بما أنزل على محمد الله أكبر whoever has sexual intercourse with a woman on a menses or a woman from the back passage right and I'm gonna point something out my sisters and my brothers who are listening anyone who thinks that maybe discussing these topics are inappropriate for those who haven't already found out yet and it's on the Daily Mail and other news outlets. What have they been teaching nine-year-olds? They've been giving them homework to go and play around with themselves. It's all over the news, my sisters. And how a woman can have pleasure, right? By having sexual intercourse with that which we just mentioned. To be haram. It's all over the internet. And then while we still have certain individuals who are a bit backwards in their thinking, right? One of the ways that the haqq diminishes, that the truth becomes less and less known, my sisters and my brothers, it is because of ignorance, right? Also because there's not much that is being propagated, right? Teaching the people and educating them about what is halal and what is haram. Just yesterday in the lecture, I was speaking about how we are moving into an era and those who are going to suffer the most are none other than our children. Maybe not this generation, I'll tell you guys why. Because our generation is a transitional generation. We've become very used to what is haram, like these homosexual practices. I don't think anyone doubts, right? It's validity in Islam. Well, as to whether it is haram or not. So we, 
as a generation are pretty well acquainted to what the scripture says what the scripture clearly mentions and me I'm just quoting I don't have my own views and opinions just in case we have someone here that works for channel 4 that wants to take out of context what I'm saying Abu Taymin doesn't have any views right it's clearly mentioned in the Quran that it's a fahisha that's an immoral despicable act it's mentioned in the Quran I don't have any views it's mentioned, I'm just mentioning what it says there likewise the Torah Jews and also the scripture according to the teachings of the church same sex marriages are what? unacceptable and this is me just quoting the bottom line is we are the transitional generation that has seen an era or a period where these things are unacceptable but our children the next generation may well find themselves in a situation where right they begin to think that this is actually okay which one is worse to practice to practice homosexual practices or to think that it's okay or to legitimize, to legitimize it which one is worse which one is worse to legitimize it is far worse and that is because one and it may well be that it is done unintentionally he now begins to deny what's actually mentioned in the Quran Allah is telling you that it is a fahisha our children may say, but dad, what's wrong with it? I don't see anything wrong with it. Not knowing what Allah Azza wa Jalla said. And also because it's become so popularized and normalized, right, where we live. Am I wrong to say that? Isn't this exactly what we're seeing now from leading figures? The Scottish Prime Minister, right? Scottish Prime Minister. Came, he came out and he said that homosexuality is not a sin. I'm just quoting again, right? So now, you're going to see the next generation of Muslims. Oh, that Prime Minister is brown. I'm brown as well. Right? He must have a point in what he's saying. So this is something that is impermissible. Here the Messiah is saying, whether sexual intercourse with a woman who's on a menses, or from the back passage, O kahinan, or goes and visits a fortune teller and believes what the fortune teller says. فَقَدْ كَفَرَ بِمَا أُنزِلْ عَلَى محمد. This person has committed kufr in that which was sent down upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's serious. Narrated by Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi on the authority of Abu Huraira and he was graded by Shaykh al-Albani to be authentic. وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ فَقَدْ بَرِئِ Right? Anything other than that, it is perfectly permissible for a man to do with his wife, right? To fondle with her, right? To do anything else, to kiss her, all of these things are perfectly fine. That which has been exempted is a woman on a menses, and likewise, from the back passage, the Messiah cursed them. مَلْعُونٌ مَنْ أَتَمْ رَأَةً فِي دُبُرِهَا Curse is the one who has sexual intercourse with a woman from the back passage. Also in another hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ رَجُلٍ أَتَىٰ رَجُلٍ أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ فِي دُبُرِهَا Allah will not look at a man who has sexual intercourse with a man from the back passage and likewise a woman. Allah is not going to look at him. Right? Anything other than that, it is fine. And the evidence for it is Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يأمرني فأتذر فيباشر ونحايد I would be on my menses and the Messiah Allah would instruct me now to cover the lower part of my body. And then he would fondle with me. He would fondle with me. The Messiah wouldn't just abandon his wives when they were on their menses. He should, it still showed them significance. And then you have the hadith of Mu'ad ibn al-Jabr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Annahu sa'ala al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He asked the Messiah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is permissible? Ma yahillu li rajul min imra'ati wa hiya haid. Or min imra'ati wa hiya haid. What is permissible for a man when his wife is on her menses? He says, ma fawq al-izar, anything above the lower garment. طيب, what if an individual now ends up having sexual intercourse with his wife when she is on her menses? 
The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked this hadith Abdullah ibn Abbas. يَتَصَدَّقُ بِدِينَارِ أو بِنِسْبِ دِينَارِ He must pay a dinar or half a dinar in sadaqah. He must pay a dinar or half a dinar in sadaqah. Right? Scholars, they, you know, they differed with regards to this authenticity. However, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim, Ibn Hajar, Imam Ahmed, they all graded the hadith to be sound. So how much is that? يَتَصَدَّقُ dinar. He pays one dinar or half a dinar. Right? It is equivalent to 4.25 grams in gold. So one dinar is what? 4.25 grams in gold. 4.25 grams in gold. And the Messenger ﷺ gave the option of half a dinar. Al He has the choice to do one, any of the two. Right? So then you have to check. You have to go to Google. How much is 4.25 grams of gold? Right? At today's rate. And however amount it gives you, you have to what? Give it in charity. And most importantly, my sisters and my brothers, one has to make tawbah. He has to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both the man and the woman. Say, but sister may say, Wallahi, he asked and I gave. It doesn't work like that. Even if it means, right, that you put on your abaya and you leave. And you go to your mother's house. Because he's refusing to, right, to back off. You must do that. You can't just give in straight away. And the same goes, I get these questions all the time in the month of Ramadan. A sister saying, Wallahi, he asked me and I just basically, you know, gave in. While I was fasting, do I now have to fast two months in a row? I was like, your sister, you have to make sure you pack your bags and leave. Right? Put your hijab on and get out. Don't you say, oh, yeah, it doesn't work like that. I remember our Shaykh Salih Sindi, Hafizullah Ta'ala, said this is very example in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Masjid. Likewise, my sisters, that which one cannot do with his wife when she's on her menses is to divorce her. يَحْرُمُ عَلَى الرَّجُلِ أَن يُطَلِّقَ إِمْرَأَتَهُ وَهِيَ حَائِقَ this type of talaq is called a bid'i talaq, an innovative type of talaq. Does that make sense? He's not allowed to do that. If he does want to divorce her, he waits till she comes off her menses, he divorces her, right? He divorces her. When she's come off her menses, right? And la yutalliqaha fi haydin wa fi tuhrin qad jama'aha fihi. And also, he divorces her not having had sexual intercourse with her. I'll say that again. A woman's on a men's sit and this guy's fuming. Right? He wants to give her P45. Right? Her marching orders. He's fuming. And subhanAllah, this will show us the beauty of Al-Islam and how Al-Islam is trying to keep the husband and wife together for as long as possible. So, right, she got on his nerves and he just uh, wants to divorce her. We say to him, no, don't divorce her, right? Wait till she comes off her menses. When she's come off her menses, also make sure you don't have sexual intercourse with her, right? Divorce her then. However, if he had sexual intercourse with her, he would have to wait before divorcing her. And la yutalliqaha fi haydin wa fi tuhrin qad jama'aha fiha. Is that clear? So on a men says you can't, and then likewise, oh, you know, like at the beginning of a men says, because, you know, emotions tend to kind of like spiral out of control. She did something to him, and he wants to divorce her, right? However, He's thinking about divorce her and then maybe the last day she bought him a box of chocolates and she's on her menses. And he's still contemplating, now she's off her menses, still contemplating, shall I divorce her, shall I not? Right? And then he has sexual intercourse with her and then she gets on his nerves again. He said, you know what? Let me divorce her. 
that you can't. You have to wait because there's a possibility that he got pregnant. Sahih? There's a possibility that he actually got her pregnant in that session that he had with her. So he's not allowed to divorce. He has to wait till she huh, starts her menses again, right? And then after her menses comes to her, then he can divorce her. Look how, right, Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, stretches the time before he's allowed to divorce her. Because let's be honest, my sisters, when a woman's on her menses, you know, she's a lot of the time not her normal self. It's not a misogynistic statement. Huh? Zakiriya. I'll just quote again. I'll say, I think that's been medically proven. Yeah, <laughs> Did everyone get that? You need to teach him. You need to teach your husband this. Right? You need to teach him that he's not allowed to do that. طيب. Now we're inshallah ta'ala going to go into right, some of the things that a woman herself can't actually do when she is on her menses. We're nearly done my sisters, yeah? Looks like we're going to get out here, inshallah ta'ala, earlier than expected. Number one, she's not allowed to touch the mushaf. And you guys are probably going to have 101 questions about this. Don't worry, I'm going to explain it. Masul mushaf, she's not allowed to touch the mushaf. And that's every part of the mushaf. Likewise, someone who doesn't have wudu or is in the state of janaba, right? This is the major spiritual impurity. He is not. Allowed to touch the Mus'haf. What's my evidence? The narration of Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr radiyallahu rahimahullahu ta'ala anna fil kitab alladhi katabahu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam li Amr ibn Hazm an la yamassal qur'ana illa tahir One time the Messiah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a book to Amr ibn Hazm which had a whole lot of instructions in there. And he said one should not touch it unless he's in a state of tahara. And by the way, this is the position of the four great Imams of Fiqh, Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, Ahmed, and Malik. And this is also the position of the companions. Sa'd ibn Miwaqas, ibn Umar, Salman al-Farisi, they all gave the fatwa. And no one ever opposed them, which has been documented historically. Does that make sense? However, if you did want to read the Quran, you can always wear gloves. Right? You can always wear gloves. You may say to me now, but I really need to read the Quran. I'm a teacher. Right? I have to revise it. I normally revise my Quran. Go get gloves. Sure, they can find gloves that are pretty thin, right? That are easy for a couple of hours. Labas. If you got an alternative, then inshallah ta'ala, there's no what? Darura involved here. There's no necessity. A beautiful benefit, I think I'll mention as a reminder my sisters. That Sheikh Abdul Razak al-Badr, he mentioned, right? Quoting Ibn Taymiyyah, and it's connected to this mas'ala. Ibn Taymiyyah said, فَإِذَا كَانَ وَرَقُهُ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَّهَرُونَ Right? If the pages of this Qur'an is not touched except by those who are in the state of purity, فَمَعَانِيهِ لَا, يه... لا يُهْتَدَى أو لا يهتدي بها إلا القلوب الطاهرة. If that is the case, then also know that its meanings, right, that you find in the Quran, one will not be guided to it unless he has a pure heart. الله أكبر. وإذا كان الملك لا يدخل بيت فيه كلب، فالمعاني التي تحبها الملائكة لا تدخل قلبا. فيه أخلاق الكلاب المذمومة الله he says referring to the hadith of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم if the angels don't enter into a house that has a dog or images they don't go into a house which has images or a dog then indeed the ma'ani the meanings of the Quran my brothers and my sisters will not enter into a heart of a person who has the etiquette of a dog in the way he behaves. And the angels will not ascend, right, 
on these type of individuals? Allahu Akbar. So the more pure our heart is, the more of a chance that the Quran will be guided to a heart like that. Second thing, my sisters, is al lubthu fil masjid. Remaining in the masjid. And the masjid, of course, has corridors, then you have also a praying area. You have like that outside area. Hmm? She is not allowed to sit inside of the masjid if she is in the state of what? She's in the state of a menses. Again, this is the position of the four great imams of fiqh. And this is the fatwa of Sheikh bin Ba'ad, Sheikh ibn Uthaymin, and other than them. And that is due to a number of hadith. One of the strongest hadith, my sisters and brothers, is the following. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, Qala li Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nawilini al-khumrah. Pass me that prayer mat. It's inside of the masjid. Nawilini al-khumrah min al-masjid. Go inside of the masjid and then get me the prayer mat. Qalat, she said, فقلت, I said to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inni ha'id. Her initial reaction was, Ya Messenger, or Messenger of Allah, I'm in a state of menses. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, Inna hayzataki laysat fi yadiki. Laysat fi yadiki. O Aisha, your menses is not inside of your hand. Reach out and get it. The reason why I mention this hadith is the fact that she reacted like this, it shows al-mustaqar. That which was well established amongst them was that you cannot enter into the masjid when you're on your menses. Otherwise, she wouldn't have reacted like that. I hope everyone, inshallah ta'ala, saw the way we extrapolated this ruling. Does that make sense? Also on the day of Eid, Umm Atiyah radiallahu ta'ala, she said, أَمَرَنَا النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ أو أُمِرْنَا in another narration أَن نُخْرِجَ فِي الْعِيدَيْنِ الْعَوَاتِقَ وَذَوَاتِ الْخُدُورِ وَأَمَرَ الْحُيَّضَ يَعْتَزِلْنَا مُصَلَّى الْمُسْلِمِينَ The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم commanded us that we come out for Eid that the women should come out for Eid right however we should stay away from what the musalla where the Muslims are praying at the time of the prayer, where they're praying, we should stay away from it. Those who are mentioned with the awatiq, a woman that has just reached the age of adolescence. al khudur, you know, the virgin girl, the Messiah is saying, all of them should come out. And it clearly shows that the virgin girl and a woman that has just reached the age of adolescence, normally she would remain shy inside of a house. And when coming out, my sisters, right, and my brothers, we shouldn't be dressed in a way as if we are going to a fancy dress party. Right? How should a woman leave the house, especially on Eid? I've mentioned this reminder every single, day, every single year on the 30th day of Ramadan. I stand on the minbar. Sometimes even the men get a little bit upset. Right? We are not going to a fancy dress party. Right? We are not going to the Eid Salah dressing to impress. Who are we going to impress, my sisters? Right? No one said you can't wear nice clothes. Go wear nice clothes inside of the house. Right? But we have to what? Dress in a manner that doesn't reveal our adornment. Take these principles, my sisters. Right? A woman should be dressing modesty. Should be dressing modestly. And likewise, she shouldn't be drawing attention to herself. I'll say that again. A woman should be dressing modestly and likewise she should not be drawing attention to herself. So anything that involves you drawing attention to yourself is something that needs to be avoided. Right? And what modestly means is that a woman should not be going outside, right? Wearing makeup, wearing jewelry, wearing bangles, right? Which is of course going to bring attention to herself. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and my sisters, you should advise your husband as if he tries to do anything against what we are saying here. لا تمنعوا إما الله مساجد الله A man is not allowed to stop his woman from going to the masjid. I can't stop my wife and say, listen, don't go to the masjid. I can't do that. I'm not allowed to stop her. 
Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you can't stop her. My father, or her father should I say, can't stop his daughter from going to the masjid. If she wanted to go, she can go. However, وَلْيَخْرُجْنَ وَهُنَّ تَفِلَتْ Right? She should leave unbeautified. Not wearing perfume. Right? That's how she should leave the house when entering or when visiting the masjid, the house of Allah Azza wa And let me mention this, my sisters. I know it's hard. It gets very hot. And sometimes we may even be mocked and ridiculed every moment that you are preserving the hijab in a manner that is pleasing to Allah as you are being rewarded. And this is something that the men miss out on. Every moment you're wearing the hijab, you are covered properly. Not exposing any part that needs to be covered. You are being rewarded, my sister. Right? And I know also letting go of makeup and fear Allah, my sisters, don't look at anyone who's maybe wearing makeup. It's hard and you want to look good. I'll give you guys, inshallah ta'ala, a very good alternative. Huh? The alternative is wake up in the night and pray. And you will look absolutely amazing. Because praying in the night, it puts a glow on your faces, my sisters. Hassan al-Basri, he said, ما بال المتهجدين بالليل من أحسن الناس وجوهن في النار. Why is it that those who pray at night, they have the nicest of faces in the day? لأنهم خلوا بالرحمن فألبسهم الله من نوره. And that is because they secluded themselves with the light of Allah, and He what adorned them with His light. They secluded themselves with Allah at night, so Allah has covered them with nur. It will make you look good. Slap some Vaseline on your face, inshallah ta'ala. Right, pray at night. And inshallah ta'ala, you won't have anything to worry about. Right. Some a sister may say, but who's gonna, you know, find me to be his wife? If I'm always just at home or I'm not, you know, making myself look good. My sisters. May Allah bless you all. Have you guys heard of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu? I think we all have, right? One day, he was patrolling the streets of Al-Medina. When him and some of his servants became tired, he began to lean on one of the houses. Right? And then he began to hear a conversation taking place between the wife. Sorry. He began to hear a conversation between the mother and her daughter. The mother instructing the daughter, O oh daughter, get up and go and mix water with milk. To cut a very long story short because I don't want to run out of time. I've, spoke to, I've spoken about it in the, my recent lecture. Uh, it's on my channel. It's called Don't Be Sad. Right? It was a lesson on Tawheed. A shahid min al-kalam. She said to her, didn't you hear what Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu said today? Oh, the Lord that he passed. That one should not mix water with leban, with milk. She told her, listen my daughter, you are when no one can see you, nor Umar or any of his servants. Right? Get up and mix the water with milk. She said to her, if we are in a place where nobody can see us, right? Umar can't see us, but the Lord of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu can see us. Right? Allahu Akbar. The Lord of Umar Khattab can see us. I wouldn't want to, do, want, want to obey him when we are in his presence, but then behind his back, I violate the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So subhanAllah, you know, because you know Tawheed, my brothers and my sisters, what does it do if you learn about Allah and you actualize and you allow it to internalize and so on and so forth? Ibn al-Qayyim says, Tawheed يَفْتَحُ لِلْعَبْدِ بَابِ الْخَيْرِ وَالسُّرُورِ Tawheed opens the door of what? Goodness and likewise happiness. She was a righteous individual, a person who understood that Allah is watching over her and that He hears everything, right? And He can see everything. She internalized that. And this is what we need at this moment in time, especially when we are under our blankets and we're looking at haram. So just her establishing a tawheed, the 
the rights of Allah upon her. Look what happened. Umar al-Khattab went home. Next morning he tells all of his sons, who is ready to get married? Who is ready to get married? This lady is always at home, huh? She thought maybe nobody can see her. Right? That's not how she thought, my sisters. Mada Hassan, his son Isam, stood up and he said, right, I'll marry her. Isam gets married to her and of course she's going to get happy, right? What did we mention earlier? Ibn al-Qayyim, Tawheed yaftahu baab al-Khayr, baab al-Tawheed yaftahu baab al-Khayr wa surur. Tawheed, he opens that door of goodness and likewise what? Happiness. Of course she got happy. Okay, married. She gave birth to a girl. This girl got married and then they gave birth to who? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz doesn't need an introduction. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, even though he was the eighth caliphate after the Prophet sallallahu wasallam, the scholars of Islam, they consider him as the fifth most virtuous after Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. Allah, look at all the stuff that Allah gave her. Because of a tawheed, because of her sticking to the laws of Allah, she was happy and look what Allah gave her of her progeny. Huh? If you just do the right thing, my sisters, I will tell you and guarantee you. Allah will open doors of happiness. You don't, want, you don't need to slap yourself across Instagram or TikTok and right. You don't need to do that. You want happiness, right? You want to feel good in your life. It is not going to be done by way of haram. Well, I would love to read out all of these sisters who email me and message me. Brother, please help me. Say, what happened? I was in a haram relationship. Say, why? She goes, well, I made me all of these promises. He said, I'm going to be his Khadija. Right? I'm going to be his Khadija, he said. So I believed it. And I thought he was going to spend the rest of his life with me. And then what did he do? After taking my shyness, he committed sexual intercourse with me and then he dumped me. And wallah, she's broken. Her heart is smashed into pieces. And she's struggling to get over it. Please, get, sisters, when you get a chance, listen to that lecture. Do not be sad. I quoted even a brother who's going through a heartbreak. And this is what the consequences of doing haram. A lot of us think when we sin, we only have to deal with the consequences and the effects of our sins when we meet Allah. No. Almost instantly it comes back to haunt you, my sisters and my brothers. Right? Anyways, there's a lot of evidences. Hadith Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Hadith Zayd ibn Asim. But uh, only if a woman now wanted to cross the path or cross the masjid, she's allowed. But she would have to make sure that she ties a very tight compress that prevents leakage. When walking through the masjid, she can do that. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala sometimes would do that and then she would stop to ask about how the sick person is and then she would keep it moving. But to stay there, it's not something that's allowed. The next thing that she's not allowed to do is At-tawaf if'ali ma yaf'al haj ghira la tutufi bil bayti hatta tathuri You're not allowed to what? To tawaf around the Kaaba. Right? Also what she can't do, my sisters, I hope you guys are writing it down. Qira'atul Qur'an. Qira'atul Qur'an. She's allowed to read the Qur'an. She's not allowed to read the Qur'an. Right? This is actually what the position of Ahmed, Shafi'i and Abu Hanifa. However, Malik was a bit different. Right? Alima Malik, he said, if she fears, for example, that she's going to forget her Quran, or she's like a teacher, she has like a usual wird. How do you say wird in English? Well, you know, she has a set time when she normally reads to her teacher, for example, or she reads in order to revise the Quran. In that case, she might be what? Exempted. However, if she doesn't normally have that wird to start reading Quran, then no. What's the evidence? Ali ibn Abi Talib said, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقرئنا القرآن ما لم يكن جنوبا. He would what? Teach us the Quran as long as he was not in a state of janaba. As long as he was in a state of janaba. Which is a major spiritual impurity. Being on your menses is also a major spiritual impurity. 
However, there are certain things, my sisters, like du'as that are from the Quran, like Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, right? Where one intends to do his adhkar, his morning and evening adhkar, for example, which may involve a verse from the Quran, in that case, it's fine. That's exempted. Also, what you can do, you can open the Quran and just look at it without uttering it. Huh? You can do that as well. You can do as much dhikr as you want. Insha'Allah ta'ala. Taib, that which relates to yellowish and murky slash brownish discharge. I think that what they also call it is spotting, right? Is that what they call it? Huh? Taib. The spotting or this yellowish, murky, brownish discharge that the woman sees at the time of her menses would be considered menses. So you have your menses from the 15th order to the 22nd. And then you're seeing this yellowy, brownish, purplish, whatever color it might be. And then they ask, okay, is this actually menses? Is it not? Is it at a time? If it's at a time of when you normally have your menses, it is considered what? Menses. However, if it's outside of these times, let's just say a woman normally she comes off her menses on the 22nd. And then on the 24th, she's seeing this yellowy, right, purpley, brownish spotting. Right? On the 24th, two days after she's come off her menses. Umm Atiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, Kunna la na'uddu al-kudrata wa sufrata ba'd al-tuhri shay'a. The browny slash yellowy type of discharge, after we would come off our menses, we wouldn't consider it anything. We would disregard it. This is after the menses period. Does that make sense? So that was the next thing. Tayyib. So also another important issue, my sisters. When a woman now comes off her menses at the time of Isha, and likewise, when she comes off her menses at the time of Asr, how many prayers does she need to pray? I want you guys to really pay attention here, my sisters, right? Pay focus. These terms, I want you guys to get familiar with it. Woman Sara Ahlan li wujubihi. What this means is, and you're going to find it a lot in the books of fiqh, once the time of Asr kicks in, would you agree that the Asr prayer has become mandatory upon all of us. I want everyone here, we reach the age of puberty, unless you have like an excuse, like for example, you're traveling or whatever have you, right? Or you're on your menses. Asr prayer has become wajib, has become mandatory upon all of us. Sorry? Me, Zakaria, and all of the sisters, are behind the screen, right? It has become wajib upon all of us. Because we've all reached the age of puberty and so on and so forth. This is upon us entering into the time of Asr or the time of Asr kicking in. I hope you guys are. Taib, you guys understand this point I just made. It became wajib upon us simply because the time of Asr kicked in. So now, the time of Asr has kicked in. Right? And I have come off my menses. Is the Asr prayer wajib upon me? Do I have to pray Asr? Huh? I have to pray Asr without a shadow of a doubt. I have to pray Asr. Because I'm alive at a time when Asr prayer has kicked in. Okay. Give you guys another example. Maghrib prayer kicked in. And then I came off my menses. Is it wajib upon me to pray Maghrib? Taib. What if now I came off my menses one hour after Fajr? Do I need to pray Fajr? Huh? Now let's just say for example at 9 a.m. At 9 a.m. I came off my menses. Do I need to pray Fajr? You don't need to pray Fajr. Does that make sense? You don't need to pray Fajr. 
طيب now pay attention right pay attention guys yeah what are the prayers that you're allowed to normally combine when you travel out huh asr and dhuhr maghrib and isha are you allowed to combine fajr with anything good because this is going to come in handy here the prayers that you're allowed to combine it comes in handy somewhere here in this masala if you come off your menses at the time of Asr, this is still before Maghrib. Let's just say there's five minutes left till Maghrib. Would you agree that you're still breathing at the time of Asr? You're still a human being that's breathing, right? Type. You would have to pray Asr, of course. And what else? You would have to pray Dhuhr with it as well. This is the position of Imam Ahmed and also Imam Shafi'i. This is the position of Imam Ahmed and Imam Shafi'i. I know there's a difference of opinion, my sisters. I can tell that with the reaction. Someone sounded like they were having a panic attack. Right? Are you guys with me? You would have to combine... Right? Sorry. You would have to pray the prayers that you would normally be allowed to combine when you're on your travels. So in this case, Asr and likewise Dhuhr. Can you shorten it? No. You would have to pray Dhuhr and likewise Asr. That's the first scenario. Second scenario is you came off your menses before Fajr. It's still considered Isha time. Agreed? It's still considered Isha time. Isha you can normally combine with which prayer when you're on your travels? Maghrib. So you have to of course pray Isha and what else? Maghrib. This is the position of both Imam Ahmed and also what? Imam Shafi'i. What is the evidence? Their evidence is the two statements of Abdullah ibn Abbas and also Abdurrahman ibn Awf. This is the fatwa that they gave. Akhraju ibn Abi Shayba wa ibn al-Mundir wa al-Bayhaqi wa Abd al-Razaq Right? And when they gave this fatwa, and you learn this in the Surah Al-Fiqh, my, my sisters and my brothers, right? If a companion gives a fatwa, right? And no one opposes him on this fatwa that he gave, this would be considered proof. There are conditions that I mentioned, but this is just quickly in summary. Also, Imam Ahmad said, Aamatu tabi'ina yaquluna bihada al-qawl illa al-hasana wahda. All of the tabi'een, the students of the companions, they take this position except Hassan al-Basri. Right? Even Hafid ibn Hajar, he said, قَالَ أَبُوْ بَكَرِ ibn إِسْحَاقِ لَا أَعْلَمُ أَحَدًا مِنَ الصَّحَابَةَ أَوْ مِنَ الصَّحَابَةِ لَا أَعْلَمُ أَحَدًا مِنَ الصَّحَابَةِ خَالَفَهُمَا I don't know anyone from amongst the companions who objected to the fatwa that they gave. Right? So it's a very, very strong position, my sisters. It's a very strong position. It is a safer position as well. Sorry if I gave you guys any doubts. Huh? But I'm giving you guys a very popular position, which is substantiated with the fatah of the companions and the tabi'een. Wallahu a'lam. How do we know if one has come of her menses? Al-Tuhru yu'rafu bi-ihda alamatayn A woman has come of her menses if one of two things happen. Both don't need to happen. One of two is sufficient. Number one, Nuzulu al-Qassat al-Bayda Right? When she sees that white discharge, which shoots off from the womb, right? Which one normally sees when the menses comes to an end. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sorry, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, huh? would say to the women, 
Do not be hasty. لا تعجلنا حتى ترينا القصة البيضاء. Do not be hasty in jumping off your menses up until you see that white discharge. Right? So what did the women used to do? They would send little boxes that had inside of it um, cotton. They would use this cotton, right, for their front private area and then they would send it to Aisha and she would see to determine and to pass a judgment as to whether this woman has come off her menses or not. And this would teach them this would actually teach them as to when she's still on it and when she's not. Does that make sense? The second way, my sisters, is al-jufuf. Dryness. Right? Dryness. If one of two uh, if one of these two things happens, then she comes off her menses. Then she comes off her menses. Now the last mas'ala. The last point. I think some of you guys are in a hurry. You need to go to White Chapel, right? I don't think they'll let you in if you don't have a ticket. Last mas'ala. Ar-rutuba allati takhruju min farj al-mar'a. You know that natural discharge that comes out of a woman's front private part. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? Huh? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? This natural discharge that comes out, which is very common. You could be out and about and then there's this natural discharge, white discharge that comes out. Is it impure? Does it make my clothes impure? Right? Do I need to make wudu now? This is a discussion. The first issue, is it pure or not? According to the Hanabil and the Shafi'iyah, it is what? Tahira. It is pure. Meaning, it doesn't make your clothes impure. Najis. Huh? Does that make sense? So if it does come in contact with your clothing, do you need to wash your clothing? The answer is no. You don't need to wash your clothing. Right? There is another view out there that is actually impure. But... Inshallah ta'ala, the correct view is that it is not impure. It is actually pure and it doesn't make your clothes impure. So if you did come in contact with your clothes, inshallah ta'ala, you don't need to worry about changing your clothes and so on and so forth. And our evidence for this is, there's nothing that determines or there's not a delete that says that, okay, if this now comes in contact with your clothing, then it has now made it impure. Also, we have the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where she used to clean off using her nails or using a miswak, right? The many, the semen of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the clothing that it came in contact with. She would use her nails, she would take it off. Now it was, there's the scholars they say, the fact that um, this is many and a lot of the time a woman's, you know, natural discharge will also come in contact with the clothing. They didn't wash it and so on and so forth. Because of that, you know, the Messiah didn't wash it. She would what? Scratch it off with her nails and then he would go out and pray with it. And anything that is impure, you wouldn't do that with feces, right? If feces was, would you scratch it off and then wear it? No, nobody would do that. Right? So the fact that she would scratch off the semen, the scholars even mentioned that semen is pure. If it came in contact with your clothing, it's fine. If one prayed in it, you wouldn't make... Um, it wouldn't make his salah invalid. But of course, I don't think anyone wants to walk around with that, but I'd rather wash it off. But Shahid, if someone did do that, someone did do that, his salah wouldn't be invalid. Type second point that comes under this is, does she now have to renew her wudu? Does it break her wudu? Do you guys remember what I said right at the beginning? Anything that comes out of the front private part, she has to what? Oh, it breaks her wudu. Unless, of course, she's suffering from a continuous, where it's continuously coming out all the time. It's continuously coming out all the time. Again, it's a very common question. The sister says, well, it comes out all the time. Right? I make wudu and it comes out again. Her hukum, her ruling would be the same as... Huh? 
The same as who? A woman who's going through a what? Istihala. Or a man who's suffering from that continuous what? Bowl that's coming out of his private part. Continuous urine. And the only one that says that it doesn't break your wudu was Ibn Hazm, which is a very rare view. Everyone else said it actually breaks your wudu, except Ibn Hazm. And many sisters actually think that it doesn't. And it's very hard. I know it's difficult. And it would be easier upon the people if we said, oh, don't worry, it doesn't break your wudu, but wallah, it's very hard on the nafs. And the only one that said that it breaks it is what? None other than Ibn Hazm, rahmatullahi alayhi. طيب. Alhamdulillah, Zakaria, we made it. Right. Me and Zakaria have been planning this course, I think, since I came back from Medina. It's like a year and three months ago. صح? I said, I can't leave. I can't leave for my masters because I'm going to leave. I'm sick and tired of this place. Right? To go do my masters, inshallah ta'ala. Right? Um, without doing this course. Very, very common. I just wanted to kind of like take my sisters out of this issue that they have. I'm really hoping. Sisters, please let me know, right? Have I answered a lot of the questions that you had? Alhamdulillah. There's still more questions I'm going to go through. Don't worry. Right? I just want, inshallah, you know, a video to be ready that I can just go and, you know, upload it onto my channel. Anytime a sister asks questions, send her that. Educate yourself. Instead of constantly asking one or two questions and then being back to square one again, what does, uh, what do I do, and so on and so forth. So these are some questions, my sisters, that are very common. They are very very common. I'm going to quickly answer it. I know you guys are probably still going to have questions, so do get them ready, right? But these are some of the very common questions that sisters tend to ask. First question I'm going to start with is, I'm at work in the winter. Very common, sah? I'm at work, right? I come off my menses at door time. I come off my menses at door time. And in the winter, if you're doing a nine to five, door, asir, maghrib, it's all at work time, right? It's within that nine to five period. It is within that nine to five period. The salah is wajib. You have to pray. You've become someone now who's ahlan lil wujub. What I was mentioning earlier, the salah has become wajib upon you simply because what? You are breathing. You are alive when the time of asr has kicked in. Agreed? So you would have to pray dhuhr, asr, maghrib. Is it possible now for you to take a shower at work? I don't know, Do they have most workplace where you can take a shower? Type the asal is that you need to take a shower. Right? Some workplaces do have that. If a woman on her break or um, lunch time, she quickly goes and has a shower, it is possible. I'm bringing all types of possibilities. She would have to do that. And then pray at that time. The second option that she has is to seek permission to leave. Is that possible, Zakiri, you think? Because they allow her to leave if she's sick. Maybe she can pull that card of, oh, I feel sick. Which is not a lie. A lot of the time they do get sick, Sahih. They do get sick. Maybe she can pull that card, Allahu Alam. I'm not telling you guys to lie, by the way. Someone's going to cut this out and put it on TikTok. A'udhu Billah min TikTok. Right? Seek permission to leave. Can she say she's sick? Might well, you know, be a valid excuse because you tend to get sick, especially at a time when, I don't know, especially when you start your menses and maybe sometimes even when she comes off, Allahu Alam. She can ask, look, I need an hour's break, I need to quickly go home, maybe give me an extended lunch period, right? She goes home, she takes a shower, and then she comes back. And I'll make up for the half an hour at the end. Right? She must do that if there is a possibility. This is not just, oh, you have a choice. No, you have to, my sister. 
They tend to be pretty flexible if you have these kind of scenarios or these situations and these issues. You have to try it. However, if she doesn't have the ability now and she's maybe going to find herself in a very difficult situation, she might get her P45. Is it P45 or 60? Huh? You know, you've, never, you've never been sacked before, right? Huh? Huh? Hey Amen. P45. I think it's been sacked. Allah Alam. So if she can't do ghusl, she has to do tayammum. She does tayammum and then she prays. And here she is, Fattakullah Mastata'atum. She's fearing Allah Azza wa to the best of her ability. Did everyone get that? I think that's one of the most common questions that sisters send in with regards to her coming off her menses. Agreed? Taib. Another one probably that is very, very common. Time of the Salah kicked in. This is the Asr Salah kicked in. Is the Asr Salah wajib upon that lady? A woman who's not on her menses? Is it wajib? Yeah, it's wajib upon her. She has to pray Asr. Taib. As many women tend to do. Oh, I've got time. I'm just delay it. Right? Time goes on, 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 and then the menses starts. If you know that your menses is meant to start around this time, my sisters, do not play around the salah. You would have to what? Pray it at its earliest time. However, if you now started your menses, would you have to make up that salah after coming off your menses? Seven days down the line, would you have to make up for it? Because you became ahlan lil wujub, what I mentioned earlier. This salah became wajib upon you. You became from the people that must carry out the salah because the time of asr kicked in. Even if there's the period of what? One raka'ah. And some of the scholars say takbir until the time it, tells, it takes you to say Allahu Akbar. And there's that timing left. Right? You will still have to pray. Common question likewise of my sisters all the time, especially those who are older, when they're going for Umrah, when they are starting the month of Ramadan, am I allowed to take these tablets? What do they call them again? Huh? The pill. The tablets that they take in order to delay, in order to delay the period. My sisters, my sisters, my humble advice is to stay far away from these pills. Right? And that is because it can bring you a lot of harm. It really, really can. Normally we would say, Wallahi, if it's not going to bring you any harm, then you can take it. Or when a woman now is going for Umrah, she has these pills. Remember my sisters, This is something that Allah Azza wa Jal has prescribed upon the women of Adam. It's a natural thing. Right? Your health is far greater that you save God than doing acts of worship. It takes priority. And a lot of the time, this confusion that takes place amongst women with regards to her menses, right? It being irregular all over the place. A lot of the time, you see, it's because of these pills that they take. And it's normally popularized by the non Muslim woman who, because she has some guy that she wants to go and see, right? She has this pill a couple of days before that, so that when she does actually end up seeing him, it doesn't cause us a, bother, a, pot, a spot of bother and whatever have you. Right? Yani, yeah, month of Ramadan is about, I know you want to, right? Uh, I know you want to fast. I know likewise the last 10 nights you want to pray in the masjid, but remember you're still getting rewarded for it. Because you would normally want to do that, right? But because now something is out of your control that has happened, you can't. 
you're still going to get the reward in it, inshallah ta'ala. The Messiah said, إِذَا مَرِضَ الْعَبْدُ أَوْ سَافَرَ كُتِبَ لَهُ مَا كَانَ يَفْعَلُ صَحِيحًا مُقِيمًا If one becomes sick, right, or he travels, he still gets the same reward of what he used to do when he wasn't sick. Right? Common question is when you go out for Hajj. In Hajj, you do so many different rituals. You can do all of the rituals except what? Uh, except the tawaf around the Kaaba. You would have to wait for your menses to stop before you do tawaf. Everything else you can do. Even if you are on your menses, can you enter into the state of Ihram? Yes, you can. You make your intention, right? And then you start your Hajj. But at the end, you have to wait. Before doing that tawaf, till you come off, like your tawaf al ifada, which is a pillar from the pillars of Hajj. Which is a pillar from the pillars of Hajj. However, if she fears that she's going to miss her flight and she has to leave, we say to her, this is now a state of necessity, go and apply a tight compress onto your front private part after you've cleaned yourself, take a shower, then apply that, go do the tawaf and then leave. But you still have to come with that tawaf al ifada. There's three types of tawafs that you do when you go for Hajj tawaf al qudum, which you can skip if you are on your menses. Then the tawaf al ifada, which is what? A pillar. And then the third one, which is wajib. One is excused if she's on her menses. Right? You would have to still come with the pillar from the pillars of Hajj. And there are other questions as well. Right? My sisters, if they want to ask, they can ask, inshaAllah ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. I just want to thank the administration of the masjid who facilitated this. Right? And I just want to send a message to all of those who showed an opposition to this program because it's a taboo topic. Go see what your children are being taught in the schools now. Huh? They're telling us not to educate our sisters and our brothers. Yes, and even brothers desperately need this topic. But you're okay with your kids now being taught all of this garbage. Right? And then later on down the line, we have to pick up the pieces. They will say, Wallahi, we did all of this. We didn't even know that it was haram. Allah, a brother that I met, he goes, I didn't even know that I needed to do ghusl after ejaculating. Or after sexual intercourse. I just thought it make wudu. I've come across sisters saying, Well, I just thought you get some water, you throw it on your head. And then, Adi. And that's the end of our lesson, inshallah ta'ala. Do the sisters have any questions? Honestly, I'm over the moon that we managed to finish this course. So many people are asking for it. Sisters have been messaging in that they weren't able to make it, inshallah ta'ala. Right? Zakum Allah khayran, wa barakallahu feekum. May Allah reward Brother Zakaria as well, who took time out from his busy schedule to get this recorded. And perhaps because of his good intentions, every time when we come to this masjid and the video gets recorded, it gets a lot of views, mashallah. Perhaps because of his sincerity and him wanting the khair to spread. May Allah Azza wa bless him. Last but not least, before I forget, I forgot to mention this when I was speaking about shyness at the beginning. If you are shy, there is another option that I have for you. Go and ask someone else to ask on your behalf. This is exactly what Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu done. Kuntu rajulan madha'an fastahiyayt. I was someone who used to get a lot of medhi, urethral discharge. I was shy, so I asked someone else now to ask on my behalf. No. You guys writing it down, yeah? Write it down. Also, one of the common questions that people tend to ask all the time is, she didn't make up her misfasts till the second Ramadan came in. So this Ramadan, she missed some days. Fine, she was on her menses. She would have needed to make it up throughout the year. But she didn't till the next Ramadan came in. She needs to make Tawbah to Allah Azza wa Jal. 
and she needs to make up for these days that she missed out on as soon as possible. Um, after the second Ramadan. Um, I've had irregular bleeding for as far as I can remember. Sometimes also comes without any cramps or pain and it is the same color throughout. My mother and sister also have the same issue. My mother and sister also have the same issue. So she's basically saying she has irregular bleeding for as far as I can remember. If you guys can add to the question, right, if you guys can add to the question, whether your vaginal bleeding is continuous, right? If it's something that is continuous, how long is it going on for? Right? They can add that, that will help maybe inshallah ta'ala to answer this question. Because if it is, huh? Oh, there's another question as well. As we are from a Shafi'i background, we've been following the Shafi'i Fatawa of going by what we see as we can go two, three months without bleeding. When bleeding throughout. So you can go two, three months without bleeding. The Shafi'i Fatwa we have been given is to follow 15 days on and 15 days off. As 15 days is the maximum, one cannot have hail. I gave you guys the evidence as to why the Hanabil have that position. I gave you guys the evidence. Now. So after three hours, you guys, you guys still gave all of this. Can I pray Isha past 12 a.m.? Let's keep it relevant, inshallah ta'ala, my sisters, okay? طيب. Can I pray Isha past 12 a.m.? What you need to do, my sister, is you are allowed to only delay it till the midpoint of the night. How do you calculate that? What time does Maghrib start? Let's just say Maghrib starts or kicks in at 9. And then Fajr kicks in at 3. How many hours is that? 6 hours. Cut that in half. Is what? 3. So you have to pray before 3 hours comes to an end. So you have to finish the Salah before what? 12 o'clock. Or you have to start it before 12 o'clock, sorry. Does that make sense? You have to start it before 12 o'clock. Can a husband go into close proximity when his wife is on her menses but not enter? Yes. Actually, wait. Like we said before, right? You are not allowed to have sexual intercourse with a woman, but anything other than that is perfectly fine. Anything other than that is perfectly fine. But that private area would need to be avoided. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How to reconcile between the difference of opinion in regards to this topic, especially. If one is not sure which madhab to follow because all are respected. Any advice on how to choose a madhab? <laughs> My humble advice to you sisters, right, is just what we studied. Inshallah ta'ala, they are credible views. Just take that. Just take that inshallah ta'ala. Right? Because this issue is, can be so, so confusing. Everything I mentioned to you guys is based on evidences. As you guys may have gathered as we were going through the course. Does that make sense? I know you're going to find little differences here and there, but just maybe try to master one of what I mentioned. A lot of it, it was based on the Hanbali. And then, <coughs> Alhamdulillah. And the Shafi'i Madhab as well, likewise. And Shafi'i and Hanbali, they're very similar. But like I said, it's just maybe a little bit better to just stick to what we mentioned. 
and take it on from there inshallah ta'ala I know Shaykh Al-Islam al Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi and this is a riwayah thaniya fil madhab a second position in the madhab right that you don't even regard all of these figures that I gave and you just have to look at what uh, you know the differences between Hayd and also Istihava the irregular continuous vaginal discord uh, discharge and based off that you go with menses or without menses that rule but just go off with what I said inshallah ta'ala and it'll make your life a lot easier and with regards to which madhab to follow if you're going to get really serious about studying the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then try to study the madhab of what your maybe family is pretty well accustomed to or what is followed in your country you know what is followed in your country and just to point out also my sisters I teach Bulugh Maram a lot and there are a bunch of hadith that we have to go through in the chapter of Hayd I wouldn't teach them these hadith up until I do this course with them because it can get very very confusing it can get very very confusing if we just try to go directly to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu whatever we went through is enough inshallah ta'ala for someone who's trying to do what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala طيب. can you keep miss fast nafal fast on the day of Arafah would it be valid no because the day of Arafah has a different cause and you making up your fast has a different reasoning Right? You can't combine the two together. You can't combine the two together. How long after brown months' discharge would you have to wait to pray? So if this brown discharge is happening around the time when you normally have your menses, we mentioned that it is considered menses. So if you saw the white discharge or it became dry, right? That which you would normally see at the end. And then it started appearing again. You would disregard that as Umm Atiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha mentioned. If you're learning the Quran, can you still read it while in the state of menses? If you're learning, then inshallah ta'ala perhaps that falls under the exempted scenarios that we talked about. When you have istihada, does the same happen with when you have istihada, does the same with salah, waiting seven, six, seven days before praying, apply to siyam during Ramadan too? Yes. Whatever you can't do, would apply. You don't fast on these days, which would be considered days of menses. As someone with a past of istihada plus irregular menses, shall I wait for 15 days before? Right? For what? For I, I consider it as istihada, I'll wait six or seven days. What did we say that you have to do here? If someone has these irregular uh, discharges, you have to do ijtihad, you have to try and find the answer. Go ask your family, how many days do they normally have it for? Right? Sisters, when the video goes up, go back to that third scenario. It is the most complicated scenario. What did we call her? What is she called? Do you guys remember what we called her? Mutahayyirah. You have a woman that has an ada. And then the second one is what? Mutamayyiz ala ada talaha. And then third is what? Mutahayyira. La tamayyiz or la tamayyiz wa la ada. Someone that's confused. We mentioned things that she needs to do. Right? Not a question, but I'm a pharmacist. I don't think it's fair to say stay away from the contraceptive pill. To delay period unless it was impermissible. I didn't say it was impermissible. Right? And I mentioned, right? Oh, sorry. I don't think she accused me of saying it's impermissible. Sorry, sister. Sorry, I just, I just rushed through it. Huh? I said, my advice would be that you stay away from it. Right? And that is because a lot of the time, it affects your monthly period and it has medical side effects based on the questions that reaches us. Perhaps you may be more knowledgeable than myself because you're a uh, medical expert, right? Uh, and generally speaking, we would say to the people, go ask two trustworthy doctors 
whether this is going to be more harmful to you than benefit. Right? But my answer was also based on that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made natural for you. Just go with that and work around it. Right? Don't force yourself to fast. Allah Azza wa Jalla has given you a concession. Right? Or if you're going to go Umrah, maybe try to you know, make it around the time when or outside of the time when you would normally have your menses. Because of the side effects that is very highly possible. If a person has dementia, or dementia, sorry, <laughs> and they are unable to perform the full prayer, what happens? If they're worried about what will happen to them on the Day of Judgment, Allah Azza wa Jal is not going to hold you to account for something that is out of your control. You have to fear Allah to the best of your ability. Right? You do what you can. وَيَفْعَلُ الْبَعْضَ مِنَ الْمَأْمُورِ إِنْ شَقَّ فِعْلُ سَائِرِ الْمَأْمُورِ you do what you can of obligations and what you can't, you are excused from it. What is the best way to perform ghusl after menses? Don't know, do they want me to... Take the hadith that I talked about. Then I mentioned hadith. Right, the sunnah way of doing it, you have of course that which covers the bare minimum. And then you also have that which? You also have that which? Right? Is the sunnah way. The two descriptions of the Sunnah way is the Hadith of Aisha and the Hadith of Maymuna, which explains how the Messenger وسلم, would do the ghusl that is more complete. If you Google, inshallah ta'ala, uh, can be sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what was the Hadith again? Uh, I've memorized it from Bulugh al-Maram. Um, يختصم الجنابة فيبدأ فيغسل يديه نعم ثم يفرغ بيمينه على شماله فيغسل فرجه ثم يتوضأ ثم يأخذ الماء فيدخل أصابع في وصول الشعر ثم حفل رزي ثلاث حفلات ثم أفاض على سائر جسده سنبوه بخاري مسلم جوجل the حديث of ميمونة on غسل you find it and the حديث of عائشة on غسل and then sunnah.com should come up and then you find the حديث that's the best way of doing it and then of course the Messenger عليه وسلم I believe advised was it Fatima or which one was it? Ala kulli hal to get musk and then to naam. Also, is there a difference between ghusl after mensa and ghusl after janaba? There are some slight differences that the scholars discuss, right? I think what you're referring to of untying your tightly plaited hair. When it comes to hayd, you have to what? Untie it. When it comes to your hayd coming off your menses, if your hair is tightly plaited, you would have to untie it. Right? There's different opinion. Do you also have to untie it every time when it comes for ghusl? The answer is no. Why? Because, you know, ghusl bath occurs a lot more or a lot more frequently than what? Then the hate that happens once a month. And now if a woman now, let's just say for example, her and her husband, you know, happens a lot. And then she has to do ghusl, does she have to now untie her tightly plaited hair? It would become a huge difficulty. So we say to her, she doesn't have to do that. But everything else should be pretty much the same. I just saw a hadith that a lady came to reverse the last with braids. Is it permissible to make ghusl without undoing them? I just answered that question, right? Just answer that question right now. What is the ruling on fasting nafal fast if you have obligatory fast remaining? Do the obligatory fast. Right? Do the obligatory fast. But when it comes to Arafah, do that Arafah. Do that Arafah, but then right after that, inshallah ta'ala, do the remaining obligatory ones inshallah ta'ala because the Arafah only comes past once a year and because the reward that comes with it huh? okay inshallah we'll talk inshallah yeah? and by the way my sisters you would have to make sure that 
the whole body is washed. Right? The whole body is washed. That the water reaches every part of the body. And even the... What do they call the... Uh, you know when someone's driving? Blind areas? What do they call it? Blind spots. Blind spots huh? Yeah, and also the blind spots. This is me trying to be... Right? The blind spots, make sure that every part is washed, inshallah ta'ala. Can I keep my wudu all day, even if I get discharged? Well, we mentioned, i.e., can I keep my wudu all day because it's easier? We mentioned if you get discharged, then it breaks your wudu. But if you want to keep your wudu, then it's fine. How to make ghusl in brief? That's a bit long. Well, I sisters, guys, I'm a bit exhausted. I just... كان بيسا يختص من الجنابة فيبدأ فيغسل يديه ثم يفرغ بيمينه على شماله فيغسل فرجه ثم يتوضأ فيدخل أصابع فأصول الشعر ثم حفن رأسه ثلاثة ثم أفاض على سائر جسده إن شاء الله تعالى عيا maybe I should have covered it قدر الله ما شاء فعل I'll 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 maybe do a separate video on this yeah Sisters, I have to go. <laughs> After we urinate, do we have to clean our private area? Yeah. <laughs> and then do wudu to pray. If you're going to be praying, then you have to make wudu. My period lasts nine days. Shall I start praying after that? Yeah, if it normally lasts nine days, that's your ada. We mentioned that it can last Six or seven days. Did we say it's only six or seven days? No. We said that's what normally happens. But in cases there are more than that. And we said that the maximum is what? Fifteen. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم جزاكم الله خيرا my sisters and my brothers. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a means of benefit to every single one of us. I hope inshallah ta'ala you guys benefited. I apologize if I said anything offensive. And I don't apologize for it at all because it wasn't offensive, <laughs> right? It was the deen of Allah Azza wa Jalla and we are unapologetic about it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.